Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 10843 in the name of Alex Salmond on Scotland's future. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And can I give a bit of warning to all members that time's really tight this afternoon? I call on Alex Salmond to speak and move the motion. First Minister, 14 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And it gives me great pleasure to, to move the motion in my name and that of my colleagues. Uh, today, 120 members and plus of this Parliament are debating Scotland's future. In four weeks' time, the, the people of Scotland get the opportunity to decide on Scotland's future. Now, that uh, peaceful, consented process of debate and discussion, which we're seeing right across the country, uh, is not unique in this world. But it's very rare, it's very precious, uh, and we should regard it as that. The, the referendum has re-energised politics in Scotland. I was canvassing in Northfield in Aberdeen just a, a few weeks ago uh, when a 60-year-old girl ran across the street demanding to know if she was on the voters' roll to vote in a referendum. Uh, I wasn't even canvassing her house at the time. Uh, and it's an example which seldom, I think, any of us have seen before, that there is an enthusiasm to participate in this referendum that we have not seen in any election, either Westminster or Scottish. I know that all of us will have had uh, similar experiences, often people who wouldn't be normally interested in the political process. They all want to have their say in this great national debate. Now, it's inspired a, an outpouring of ideas about the sort of country we seek, the sort of Scotland that we want to see. Very often, this has been a, a hugely positive development. These things uh, have been outside what we might call traditional party political structures. People who have felt excluded from the normal political processes have responded enthusiastically. New media has thrived. Town hall meetings have been packed in villages and towns across the country. So one of the, the challenges for all of us after the referendum will be to retain and to keep that sense of creativity, that sense of energy, of engagement, as we work together to build uh, a better country. Uh, another uh, benefit of this debate, uh, I give way to, to Mr Rennie. Well, Rennie. Um, I, I share his ambition that we use that energy um, through this referendum for the good of politics in the long run. I hope it's a no vote, as he hopes it's a yes vote, but I hope we do capture that energy. But can I bring him back to some of the detail? In the last week, Crawford Beveridge, Professor Stiglitz and the First Minister himself have all used transition in respect of the currency. Will the First Minister tell the Chamber about this new aspect of his policy? First Minister. Well, uh, if it were a, a new aspect of the policy and hadn't been contained in the Fiscal Commission report more than a year ago, uh, then I would be able to uh, look at uh, Mr Rennie's question with a, 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 a bit more consideration. That is exactly what the Fiscal Commission Working Group uh, said over a year ago. I, I really would commend, I've commended Mr Rennie on a number of times to read the White Paper on Independence. I would commend them also to read the Fiscal Commission Working Group report and see the profound common sense that that galaxy of uh, distinguished economists have presented, low even unto the, the Liberal Party, uh, and then take it into consideration, and there he will find the answers which he seeks. So we all agree, even Mr Rennie, as we did two weeks ago, that Scotland has got what it takes to be a successful independent country. So let's use this occasion, this national debate, to celebrate our country, our people and our potential. Scotland is one of the, the world's wealthiest nations. Uh, our GDP per head is higher than the UK as a whole. It's higher than France. It's higher than Japan. We have contributed more in tax revenues per head of population than the rest of the United Kingdom and each and every one of the last 33 years. We have creative genius. We are a nation of innovators. We are a brilliant manufacturing industry. We have a truly world-class food and drink industry. We have astonishing natural resources, huge potential in renewables, and yes, an oil and gas industry which will be producing many billions of barrels of oil for many decades to come. And many of us regard that as a substantial bonus for this nation of Scotland, not some burden that will have to be tolerated. I, I, I give way to the, to the former member for Aberdeen Central. Lewis MacDonald. 
I'm grateful, the... uh, I'm grateful to the current member for West Aberdeenshire for giving way in that gracious fashion. Can, can he tell me, in light of uh, the uh, revision of his central estimate of future oil production this morning from 24 billion to 15 to 16 billion barrels of oil equivalent, uh, what his revised estimate now is of the revenues to come from oil over the next five years? First Minister. Uh, well, can I, can I point out, uh, if we're following the, the debate at First Minister's questions, I, I pointed out from the, the work of, uh, uh, of Alec Kemp uh, that uh, the uh, 16 uh, to 17 billion barrels seem to be up to 2050, uh, and it further to come after that from the more than 100 fields which are expected still to be developed at that stage, uh, then Alec Kemp thinks it's entirely reasonable for the UK oil industry's forecast of up to be 24 billion barrels to be perfectly realisable. But I, I know that uh, Lewis Macdonald thought I was being unfair. I wasn't actually. The reason I said the member for Aberdeen uh, is I was trying to create a link with those members from Aberdeen uh, who in past have suggested that perhaps the oil was running out. And as Lewis and I well know, it's a long time since we had a, a Conservative sitting member for an Aberdeen constituency. But in the 1970s, there was one, the late Ian Sprott, then Conservative MP for Aberdeen South, speaking in the House of Commons in 1976, oil will only last another 20 to 30 years. According to the Conservative Party and according to the Labour Party, there wouldn't be any oil left at all now if we believed what they had to say in the 1970s and 80s. So if Lewis Macdonald will pardon us, we actually think that 18 billion barrels or 17 billion barrels to 2050, up to 24 billion barrels in total, is a fantastic resource and bonus for the Scottish people. But above all, if you give me a few seconds, we'll uh, make some progress and then I'll gladly take uh, the member's intervention. Uh, I was going to say, and I know the Conservative Party have this dear to their hearts, that the challenge is not to establish the enormous wealth of the country. That is a given. The challenge is to make sure that the people of this country have the opportunity to share in that uh, enormous wealth. But at its heart, the case for independence is a simple one. It's better for all of our futures if decisions about Scotland are taken by the people who care most about Scotland. That's the people who work and live in this country. No one, but no one, is likely to create a more fair, a more prosperous country than we will. 80% of Scotland's MPs at Westminster oppose the current UK Government's wider changes to Social Security. 90% oppose the bedroom tax. With independence, the people of Scotland will get the policies this democratically elected Scottish Parliament votes for. 100% of the time. <laughs> and it's worth looking at this Parliament record, and I'm going to be generous to all of the parties across this Parliament. The first Parliament introduced world-leading homelessness legislation. The second Parliament tackled Scotland's health inequalities through the ban on smoking in public places. The third Parliament reintroduced free university tuition and unanimously passed ambitious climate change targets. This Parliament is seeing world-leading action to address Scotland's relationship with alcohol, legislation to expand and transform early years education and care. Alongside that, we've adopted policies to support economic growth, cutting business rates, promoting Scotland abroad, giving coordinated support to infrastructure, key sectors of the economy. We now have higher employment, lower economic inactivity than the rest of the UK. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, that this Parliament hasn't sometimes taken the, the wrong course. But it does reflect the fact that members of this Parliament, of all parties, have worked together to reflect the values and the priorities and aspirations of the people who voted for us. Because of that, this Parliament has been able to resist the privatisation, the constant reorganisation that has been pursued in the National Health Service south of the border. But funding for our National Health Service is still at the mercy of a Westminster government led by a party which, in the words of Alistair Darling, relishes, quote, the chance to swing at the axe at the public services that millions rely on, unquote. It was Nye Bevan who once said of the National Health Service, you don't need a crystal ball when you can read the book. Today we can read the book produced by the Labour Party called The Choice, which discusses what Labour calls the Tory threat. It says under the Tories, quote, 
There is more prospect of more National Health Service services being charged for, fewer services being provided free at the point of need. Now it follows a presiding officer. If patients are charged in private money, it replaces public money. Those cuts in public spending are passed directly on to the public services of Scotland under the devolution settlement. <laughs> so increased privatisation and charging in England on top of the £25 billion of cuts promised by George Osborne is Order. a direct threat to the National Health Service and funding in Scotland. I give way to Malcolm Chisholm. Thank Sorry. the First Minister for giving way. I'm glad that the First Minister has moved on from the early scares about privatising in Scotland the health service and from the earlier misinformation about privatised services costing less money. But now they've moved on to charging. Does he not realise that the reason Labour is saying that, because we know full well that no UK government would be elected that was pledged to abolish health care free at the point of need. That simply... <laughs> that, that will not happen. And it, it's an insult Order. to the people of England to believe that it Order. will happen. First Minister... Presiding officer, Order. Andy Burnham is saying that the Conservative Party are going to abolish free care. <laughs> Has Malcolm Chisholm really got to the stage? He's defending the Tories as some defenders of the health service. Did he not understand what Unison Order. said in their debate and blog this afternoon? The threat from Westminster cutbacks to the health service in Scotland. People will be astonished that the Labour Party have come to the stage that they have to defend Tory cuts and privatisation of the health service so as they can defend the Better Together campaign. Now, the contrast in the guarantee, the constitutional guarantee independence gives to the health service is quite a different matter. We can guarantee a fairer Scotland because we can guarantee that the minimum wage rises in line with inflation. We can guarantee to ensure greater gender equality in the boardroom and in the workplace. Fairer because we can outlaw outrages such as the bedroom tax, which 90% of MPs in Scotland opposed. At the moment, the government is launching its assault through austerity on the poor. It's also starting to replace Trident at a lifetime estimated cost of £100,000 million. Wouldn't it be rather better, presiding officer, if we could remove Trident, abolish measures such as the bedroom tax, and get on with building a decent society for the Scottish people? <laughs> and alongside a fairer country, let's create a more prosperous country. And let's create a country that can offer a lifetime opportunity for the people of Scotland. At present, almost 70,000 people a year leave Scotland. More than half of them is 16 to 34. And every single family in Scotland knows of a friend or family member who has to leave to get a job or further a career. We have huge hydrocarbon reserves for the next half century, but we need to build the renewable wealth which will last forever. We want to build transform childcare provision to unleash the full potential of all of our population. With independence, we can use the wealth and control over taxation to attract more employers to invest in Scotland, creating more and better local jobs, more opportunities for young people, closer to home, keeping families together, a powerful legacy from a yes vote. But we believe if we take the powers we need and use them well and work hard, then over time we create a more prosperous country and also a fairer society. Presiding officer, in four weeks' time, when the polling stations open, it will be the first time ever that the people of Scotland have had democratic control over their own destiny. And when the polls close, Order. this is the first democratic referendum on national independence. So when they close, let's not hand that control back. Let's keep Scotland's future in Scotland's hands and then come together to build a better Scotland we know as possible. We have the ability, the talent and the resources in abundance. The people of Scotland are waking up to the greatest opportunity we will ever have on September the 18th. Let's take it. Please. I now call order. Order.
I now call Joanne Lamont to speak to and move amendment number 108 for 3.1. Ms Lamont, 10 minutes. Thank you very much, presiding officer. As I came into the parliament this morning, it felt to me that this was a very important time in the history of this place and of our country. And it is an immense privilege for me to speak on behalf of the Labour Party and move an amendment in my name at the point where the people of Scotland are making an important decision. And if we are to come together after that decision, it is important that we do not impugn the motives of those who are either arguing for no or for yes. We all care deeply about our country. So before I set out what I believe is the no case, I want to talk about how we got here and the importance of settling this question. Earlier today, I had my weekly set to with the First Minister and we debated the current issues in perhaps our usual robust and forceful way, and it's important that we do that. But over the next four weeks, we will no longer be focusing and debating with each other. We will be talking directly with the people of Scotland, something I have welcomed and relished since this debate began. And I recognise the interest and appetite that exists in our communities and towns to have these debates. It's no secret that I did not support a referendum. And while I respect the mandate which the current government has to hold it, I do believe its prominence has had negative consequences. Only last night, a woman expressing to me her concerns about the way in which families and communities have been divided. And equally, and equally the way in which Scotland has been in pause on the big decisions yeah. facing our country. So it's incumbent on all of us to find a way through this debate without leaving us so damaged at the end we cannot go back to democratic debate and policy. So I embrace the opportunity this referendum presents, the opportunity finally to answer the constitutional question and agree among us the settled will of Scotland. So whatever happens on September the 18th, Alex Salmond can claim this important legacy, that the question of Scottish independence will have been put to Scottish people and they will have been given a fair opportunity to answer it. For those who have argued for Scottish independence for so many years, then I am pleased that they will get the opportunity to test their argument in a vote. For those of us who believe we are better off as part of the United Kingdom, we will get the chance to reaffirm our place in the United Kingdom. And if we vote no, the UK will no longer be a historical decision taken by the few, but Scotland's place in the United Kingdom will have been actively confirmed and decided by the democratic will of the people. And for all of us who care about a better Scotland, it is vital that we agree on a settled constitution and go on with the job of delivering that vision. I have heard many times over the last few weeks that this is not a vote for Alex Salmond. I agree, but it is his prospectus which has been put to the Scottish people. So I congratulate the First Minister in his determination in bringing this referendum before us and giving us the opportunity to settle this question once and for all. But he will not be surprised to know there is much I disagree with in his statement. My party has made clear this week our feelings on the latest NHS argument. I also do not believe that the people of Scotland should be going to the polls with such little certainty of something as basic as a currency. And I have serious doubts about the cavalier economic assumptions and estimates that have been made to counter the predictions of the independent experts who say we will have £6 billion worth of cuts to make. Indeed, those doubts have been compounded by Sir Ian Wood in the last 24 hours. But it's for Alex Salmond to decide on which arguments the Yes campaign will deploy. It won't stop me asking the hard questions, rebutting his assertions and countering his claims. But I will put forward our case as to why people should vote to stay in the United Kingdom. Ultimately, let me progress just now. Ultimately, it will be for the people of Scotland to decide who is right and what is best. They have my every confidence that they will get that decision right. You know, as a young woman, I instinctively believed that Scotland should stay in the United Kingdom. But in the last period, I, like many of my fellow Scots, have tested the arguments. And while some have come to a different conclusion, there is no doubt that people who are voting yes and people who are voting no very often share the same ambitions for a fairer, more equal Scotland. And that will be part of the challenge post that vote. I hope they decide to vote no because I believe it is in the best interest of Scotland. I believe it with my head and with my heart. 
With my head, I look at the economic forecasts from the experts and believe the strength of the United Kingdom gives us the best chance of achieving our goals here in the Scottish Parliament. On areas like pensions and welfare, I believe that the pooling and sharing of resources across 60 million rather than 5 million just makes sense. On jobs, I believe that by being part of something bigger, we are given the security and the opportunity we want. I believe on the currency, we should be in a monetary union with the rest of the United Kingdom, with Scottish voices representing us at the heart of government. These are the arguments of the head, but the arguments of the heart are every bit as strong. I believe in working in partnership and in cooperation with our friends and neighbours, whether they're in Liverpool and Manchester, Belfast or Cardiff, Glasgow or Edinburgh. This is a cooperation. This is a cooperation which saw us stand up against fascism, create the welfare state, create the National Health Service and make significant steps on the road to tackling inequality and disadvantage. Prizes that came out of Westminster during the whole period of which the SNP opposed Labour governments which delivered that change. James Don. For giving way. Uh, you talked about the health service and standing against fascism and, and all of those things are very positive reasons and good things that came out of the union. Could you give me an example of something over the last 20 years where uh, the, the people of Scotland have benefited from being a member of the union? John Lumet. National minimum wage, tackling poverty, creating greater inequality yeah. qualities in our community. Yeah. Tackling creating this parliament which brought power closer to people. You know, you know the heart of this and why it matters to me in my soul. I look at the rest of the United Kingdom and I don't see people whose job is to do us down, but I see families facing the same challenges as the family I have and families across the whole of Scotland. I believe we should celebrate what we have in common, not emphasise our differences. I believe that borders, literal or metaphorical, should be broken down, not thrown up where they are not necessary. It is simple for me. I believe that sovereignty lies with the Scottish people and we can choose to share that with our neighbours when it is in our interest without compromising our Scottishness. So I disagree with Alex Salmond. He disagrees with the values at the heart of the Labour Party that by the strength of our common endeavour we achieve more than we achieve alone. Well, you know, people who say right throughout time not to vote for the Labour Party can hardly claim they have concerns about the Labour Party yeah. now. It well, just reminds people that in 2010, Alex Salmon told the people Members of England not to giving vote way. for the Liberal Democrats rather than a Scottish Labour Prime Minister. But however, put that to one side. Let us agree on this. Whatever the result, Scottish politics will never be the same again. If there is a yes vote, then that seems obvious. But I believe that it is equally true if there is a no vote. In one month, the constitutional question will be answered. The settled will of the Scottish people will be decided whether that is to go our own way or to continue to work in partnership with our neighbours. I have never claimed that a no vote will unlock a bounty of treasures and opportunity. And indeed, I welcome, I indeed welcome the comments of Nicola Sturgeon and John Swinney that independence equally is not a magic wand. Even Alex Salmond himself admitted would face serious challenges and it would not be easy. Because a constitutional arrangement, to my mind, is not an end in itself. We disagree about what the best arrangement is for delivering our ambitions, even though many of those ambitions are shared right across the chamber. So on the constitutional question, where we fundamentally disagree, let the people of Scotland decide on September 18th, and then let us get on with the hard work of changing Scotland, whatever hand we are dealt. Let us move past grievance and alibi and talk about what we can do rather than what we can't. We all agree the educational attainment gap in Scotland must be improved if we are to achieve a fairer society. We all recognise that our NHS and our care system face real pressures from changing demographics, and we must act and innovate if our sick and vulnerable are to get the treatment they deserve. I make this commitment that if there is a yes vote, I will accept it. If there is a no vote, I demand an equal commitment from the people on the other side of the chamber. Yeah. 
Will politics never be the same again? It cannot ever be the same again. So rather than a politics that elevates the interests of party and the political priorities of politicians, we need another kind of politics. We need a parliament to mature, to do its job, open up its thinking to the challenges facing people in the real world and with the decisions that will define the future of our country and the well-being of our people. So we stand at an important moment in the history of our country, but the challenge for all of us in here. We cannot go back to the politics of the last few years. It is incumbent on all of us to accept the result in September the 18th, come together and start doing the business of creating a fairer, more equal society in this country. I move the amendment in my name. To speak to and move amendment number 10843.1.2 with Davidson, six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, like many people in this chamber, I've made more speeches on the Constitution in the last two and a half years than I can remember. Speeches in church halls, in town halls, in school halls, and in conference halls. And in every one, I've made the economic arguments, the political arguments for staying together, and I've made some personal arguments too. But I don't think in any I have fully articulated what I feel, the sense of loss that I would have at seeing my country broken up before me and the grieving that I would do if it came to pass that Britain no longer existed. I am Scottish first. I will always be Scottish first. I'll always put Scotland first. But there is a part of me that feels like I get to be British too. And to me, it feels as if those who are proposing separation want to take that British part away from me, to tell me that it's bad or broken or wrong and to throw it in the bin and to give me something less in return. And I don't believe that it is broken or bad or wrong. When I look at Britain, I see one of the great nations of this earth. Yes, a large economy, a country that sits at the top table of the world's decision-making bodies, a trading powerhouse and all the rest of it. But more than that, I see a country that is willing to shoulder its burden, one that offers a platform of opportunity, and that makes me proud. I'm not blind to Britain's faults, and I may be jeered or sneered as I am being today, but I think if you look around the world, we are one of the good guys. We are one of the countries that other people aspire to be like. From our art, to our freedom, to our humour, to our decency, to our sense of fair play, and yes, even to our politics. I think we make a huge contribution to this planet and I want to keep doing it. And I want to keep doing it together. Yes, I'll take an intervention. Annabelle. Oh, you thank you. I'm very grateful to the member for giving, uh, taking the intervention. Uh, the, the member was suggesting that people would look up to uh, the UK as it currently is. Would they be looking up to the UK in terms of it being the fourth most unequal society in the world? Louis David. One. Firstly, it's not the fourth most unequal society in the world. Since 2010, inequality has been falling. The member knows that because her own government has stated that is true. I want us to keep contributing to the world together, and I want to stand shoulder to shoulder with my friends, my family, my allies in England, in Wales, Ms. and Do in Northern Ireland Doris. too. And I want to continue making that contribution. There are people alive in the world today because Britain shoulders her burden and because we act together. We are the second biggest giver of overseas aid on the planet. There are children that are saved by our immunisation programmes that would otherwise die. And it's not that an independent Scotland wouldn't give aid, of course it would, but it's precisely because of our size and scale that we are able to do more with what we have. Now, I know I've talked of this before in the Chamber, but I've never been more proud of my country than I was when I was a young journalist sent to Kosovo to see the Black Watch, watching soldiers my age and younger that went to my school in Buckhaven and schools just like it, patrolling the streets and protecting school children from attack, clearing bombs and stopping bullets. I know the First Minister called her involvement in Kosovo unpardonable folly, and he is entitled to that opinion. But I know that the world is a safer place for Kosovars, for ethnic Serbs and Albanians, because the service men and women of our country, because we had an integrating fighting force and the capability to act, not at this time. Even here at home, our research and medical expertise reaches far beyond our borders. Because of the UK's support structure, 
Nine out of ten women and eight out of ten men are now surviving skin cancer, thanks in part to the work being done at Dundee University. Scottish expertise, UK support, worldwide benefits. I give way to the First Minister. Is the world a safer place because of the illegal intervention in Iraq? Ruth Davidson. For a place because of our ability to work, and of course that ability must be used judiciously. But there are people huddling on a mountainside in Iraq right now that have cause to thank us putting our troops to deliver them. People who are going to be There are people in Kosovo right now who would not have been alive if they had followed your advice on what we should have done there. And for me, that's how it should be stronger, safer and better able to deliver because of Black Watch soldiers serving in Pristina next to their Royal Welsh Fusilier colleagues. Different teams operating in Africa being run from East Kilbride, academics from across the UK conducting research in Scottish universities. Labour migration is estimated to be up to 75% higher because the UK is all one country, four nations, but a single state. And I want a kid growing up in Birmingham that's good at science to say that they want to work with the Dolly the Sheep team. And I want a student in Aberdeen to decide that London's tech centre in Shoreditch is for them. And at the moment, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are Scottish or English or Welsh or Northern Irish. You can go anywhere and do anything and all be equal under the union flag. I'm 35 years old, and in those 35 years, I have never lived or worked anywhere other than Scotland. I love to travel, but I always know where's home. But the Scotland I know, the Scotland I love, is part of the UK. It's been shaped by it, and in turn has done the shaping. Every success that the UK has in this world is our success too, because we built the UK. We've driven it. Britain didn't colonise us, and it doesn't oppress us. Britain only exists because of us. Leaving it would be to lose something and to see what's left behind become diminished too. Now, I've heard the nationalist arguments, and while I don't agree with them, I can respect them. But in return, I ask them to see what I see. I ask them to see them asking us to vote for something that is less than we have now. And I don't want something less. Okay. I want to be part of something bigger, to put all the strength and resource and imagination and infinite talent that we have in Scotland and put it towards a common endeavour with our friends, our neighbours, our allies and our countrymen in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. The UK is ours. We built it. And to leave it would be to lose something of ourselves and to leave behind less. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Mr Davidson. Before I call Willarene, can I just point out to all members in the Chamber that if a member is not taking an intervention, will you please sit down and stop standing in the hope that the member might take an intervention? I call on Willie Rennie to speak to move amendment number 10843.1.1. Mr Rennie, six minutes. When I heard um, Ruth Davidson talk about her pride in being Scottish, I consider I shared her pride. When I heard members on the SNP benches scoff at her claim about being Scottish, I felt disgust at that attitude. The SNP do not have a monopoly on being Scottish. I am as proud a Scot as they are, and they should not deny it. When I was 17, I became politically active. I did so because I was impatient for change. I wanted to tackle injustice and make the world a better place. That drive is as strong today as it was 30 years ago. For me, liberalism was the answer, and it still is the answer. I want to help all individuals achieve great things, for people to be all they can be, and to fulfil their potential. When I shout freedom, it's not a cry for national freedom, but for individual freedom. As my great Liberal forefathers would have said, it's freedom from ignorance, poverty and conformity that is our vision. It's why I support education from the early years and throughout life. It's why I support the building of a strong economy and spreading that wealth. It's why personal freedom is important too, to live life as you wish as long as it does not impinge 
on someone else's freedom. As a Liberal, I believe in the outstanding power of the individual to do great things. Human nature is innately good, generous and open. That's why I have never warmed to nationalism, as I have always viewed the central philosophy as inward rather than outward looking, and I believe it divides rather than unites. I do recognise that not all supporters of independence regard themselves as isolationists. <laughs> but, the effect, but the effect and the outcome of their desired destination feeds that philosophy. Of course, Britain isn't perfect, but it's not per as imperfect as the nationalists would like you to believe. Just because it is not perfect does not mean I want to break it up. And just because I want change does not mean I want just any change that happens to come along. In fact, I think there is a lot to be proud of in our United Kingdom, a lot that helps people to achieve great things. Take science and innovation. Even though Scottish universities only form one-tenth of the UK university base, they get 13 per cent of UK funding against a population share of 8 per cent. 50 per cent more than elsewhere in the UK. I'll come to the First Minister in a second. But it's 50 per cent more than elsewhere in the UK because of the combination of the talent and access to that bigger pool of funding. I'll take the First, First Minister. Minister. I, I was struggling to, to understand the, the idea that liberalism was incompatible with wanting an independent Scotland. I, I couldn't understand that. I heard today that John Barrett, the former Liberal MP from Edinburgh West, is voting yes and has publicly announced that today in the referendum. Is that not an indication that it's perfectly proper to be a loyal Liberal, avouse liberalism and also support yes in the referendum? Yeah, yeah. Well, any... and, and members of our party are free to vote as they wish. We are not the strict party that this party seeks to do that drives out division and difference. I respect John Barrett for who he is. But I wonder if the First Minister agrees with John Barrett's criticism of the First Minister, because I suspect he doesn't agree with him in that respect. So not necessarily unity there. Take energy. To meet our ambitions for Scottish renewable energy, it makes sense to share the UK consumer base during development, to advance renewables and keep energy bills lower. Take food and drink. Scotland and Scottish businesses have been able to take good advantage of our natural food and drink products, and businesses have been able to innovate and add value to Scottish produce. The global network of 270 UK embassies, consulates and trade missions support those businesses. UK exports to Brazil have risen in the last four years by 28%, to India by 55% and to China by 115%. Our ambition should be that those embassies step up their work for us to open doors to new markets, not close their doors to Scotland. Take the single market and the single regulatory regime and the single currency that the First Minister refused to talk about. That means a business here in Edinburgh can trade across the UK with limited barriers. That trade is worth 270,000 jobs to Scotland. These examples speak to the United Kingdom as a great platform from which Scots can be all they can be. I don't want a Scotland that retreats from other countries, cutting two-thirds of our overseas representation, just as the time to promote Scottish excellence and businesses has never been better. That cuts the opportunities for Scottish universities to keep the huge funding boost they get from the UK at the very moment when the 21st century Western economies demands more innovation. That shrinks our ambition on climate change with our great renewable energy developments, just when the climate needs the whole world to rally round. My ambition is to build on a quarter of a million jobs that come from trade with the rest of the United Kingdom. My ambition is to use that large network of embassies. My ambition is to increase UK research funding, not cut it. 
That's our positive vision. I simply do not accept that the maximum potential of people in Scotland can only be achieved if we create a separate nation. A no vote is a vote of confidence in the ability of Scots to be all they can be, to aspire in the finest traditions of our nation, confident to be part of something bigger, with global reach of 60 million people, within a UK economic base with broad shoulders, proud to stand with the rest of the UK family together. We are truly better together. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the opening debate. Can I just reiterate, we're extremely tight for time this afternoon. There's a distinct possibility at least one member won't get to speak at all. We may have to cut uh, some of the speeches by a couple of minutes. So I now call Aileen McLeod to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Presenting officer, I'm delighted to uh, speak in today's debate and to set out the reasons why I want to see Scotland's future decided for the people who live and work in Scotland. And that can only be assured with a yes vote on the 18th of September. And like many in this chamber, last weekend I read with considerable interest the report in Sunday's Observer newspaper that Professor Sir Tom Devine, one of Scotland's outstanding public intellectuals, will vote yes in the independence referendum. The point isn't simply that one of Scotland's most internationally acclaimed academics has endorsed Scottish independence, important as that is. More significant were the reasons that he gave for reaching this decision. And Professor Devine stated, and I quote, it is the Scots who have succeeded most in preserving the British idea of fairness and compassion in terms of state support and intervention. Ironically, it is England since the 1980s which has embarked on a separate journey, end quote. Now, in these short sentences, I believe that Professor Devine expressed exactly what an increasing number of Scottish voters, particularly among the undecided, know to be true. Namely, that if we are to continue to deliver and to be able to deliver policies that reflect our shared commitment to uphold the values of fairness, compassion and social justice, values that have been at the very heart of public policy in Scotland for decades, then we must choose independence over the status quo. Presiding officer, nowhere are those values of fairness, compassion and social justice more in evidence than in Scotland's National Health Service. A Scottish NHS that today is publicly funded and publicly delivered and whose staff, the doctors, nurses and a vast array of trained support workers tirelessly work to support the sick and vulnerable across our communities. There is no doubt in my mind and there should be none in the minds of Scotland's voters, that the only way of ensuring Scotland's NHS remains true to the founding principles set out all those years ago by Nye Bevan, that it should meet the needs of everyone, that it be free at the point of delivery, and that it should be based on clinical need and not the ability to pay, is to vote for independence. Yeah. And as the First Minister made clear on Monday, these principles will not be mere aspirations or guidelines the in an independent Scotland. An aspirations and guidelines that are vulnerable to betrayal as political fashion change, as so clearly has been and remains the case south of the border. Instead, in an independent Scotland, we will seek to enshrine these NHS principles in a written constitution for an independent Scotland, thereby ensuring that no future government can undermine what is a foundational building block of a fair and just society and protecting future generations from the vagaries of a neoliberal political opportunism. Yeah. Now on Tuesday, well Mr Finlay can laugh, but on Tuesday the Health Secretary set out the risks the to Scotland's NHS under the status quo and of these risks none are so great as the risks to the Scottish budget of the continual cuts to public spending imposed by the Tory Liberal Coalition Government cuts that the Labour Party is committed to implementing should it be elected in the UK general election next May. And as the Health Secretary also said, for every £10 cut by Westminster from spending on health and public services, there will be £1 lost to Scotland's budget for public spending on essential services, including health, here in Scotland. Not just now, Mr Finlay. Independence, presenting officer, will ensure that Scotland's finances are under the control of this Parliament and the people of Scotland are thereby free to make their own choices about the quality of public services, including health, that they want to have available for themselves and their fellow citizens now and in the future. 
But what is most extraordinary, presiding officer, in this entire debate is the position of the Labour Party in Scotland. And it seems that in every other part of these islands, in England and in Wales, we hear Labour politicians issuing dire warnings of the devastating impact that Tory Liberal spending cuts and privatisation are having on the NHS in England and in Wales. From Andy Burnham in Westminster to Mark Drakeford in Cardiff, the clarion calls have gone up to save the NHS from privatisation and cuts. The irony is, of course, presenting officer, that in this regard, I agree with the Labour Party in England and I agree with the Labour Party in Wales. But you contrast that with the Labour Party in Scotland, where we find Labour campaigning hand in glove with its Tory and Liberal Democrat partners, the very parties that are wielding the public spending acts in Westminster, trying to convince the Scottish public that Scotland's NHS is safe inside the Union. Order. Order. The member is in her last minute. Order, please. I did not hear what Mr Finlay said. If it's on the official record, I will check it. Can I tell Parliament that time spent discussing, jeering or interrupting Mr Maxwell any time spent doing this will be taken out of backbench speeches. Ms McLeod, please continue. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I don't buy that, and it is increasingly clear that a majority of Scottish voters are not about to be fooled into believing it either. The message to the Scottish electorate is clear. If you want to protect Scotland's NHS and public services from the privatisation and cuts coming out of Westminster by this and future UK governments, then on the 18th of September, you should vote for independence. To conclude, presiding officer, people across Scotland are waking up to the fact that voting yes on the 18th of September will give us the one opportunity to ensure that we protect our NHS. And it's not only for this generation that a yes is so important, it is to secure for future generations an NHS that not only remains true to the principles set out by Nye Bevan all those years ago, but one that in every respect is representative of the fundamental values of Scottish society. And I support the motion in the First Minister's name. Before we continue, I will reiterate I will not be allowing any time for interruptions, any more time on to member speeches. Unfortunately, speeches will probably now have to be reduced. Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you very much. An independent Scotland or a political, social, economic and currency union with our closest neighbours and friends. At the end of this campaign, it is a very simple choice, and it is a choice for the people of Scotland to make. This campaign really is historic, because after 15 years of devolution, we stand at a crossroads, and the choice we make will set the direction for future generations as well as our own. The decision of the Scottish people in 1997 to set up this parliament was a decision no future government could overturn. The choice of either independence or union will be decided by the self-determination of the Scottish people and will be just as irreversible a decision. Because whatever we choose, there are tough challenges ahead. The world remains a dangerous place, divided and ill-divided. Finite resources must by definition come to an end and competitive advantage must be won and won again in every generation. Sir Ian Wood has had some important things to say on these issues this week, laid out in full in today's Press and Journal. I first worked with Sir Ian when I was Vice Chair of the Government Oil and Gas Industry Forum pilot a decade ago, and he chaired the industry leadership team. Even at that time, his clear focus was on what more could be done to maximise the recovery of oil and gas from the North Sea. <clears throat> Sir Ian Wood is happy to work with governments of any party, as ministers here well know. But when he says he cannot stand idly by while his words are misquoted in the referendum debate, we should all pay attention to what he actually says. Sir Ian Wood has never said there are 24 billion barrels of oil equivalent waiting to be extracted from the UK continental shelf. His report says that there may be as little as 12 billion barrels, and there may be as much as 24 billion barrels, but nothing is certain other than the scale of challenges to be overcome along the way. 
Sir Ian Wood believes that if government implements all his recommendations for taxes, licensing and regulation, and if the industry gets back to carrying out new exploration as it has largely ceased to do and finds a lot more oil and gas in future years, then they might be able to produce between 15 and 16 and a half billion bar barrels of oil equivalent over the next 40 years. If they do that, then future revenues for government might come in around £5 billion a year, at, not at the moment, as they did last year. Two mil, $2 billion a year less than predicted by the SNP, a shortfall of around £370 a year for every man, woman and child living in Scotland. But even more important than the numbers is what Sir Ian Wood has said about the impact of independence on this vital industry. <clears throat> Costs in the North Sea rose by 15% last year. Exploration in UK waters is at an all-time low. Critical to maximising economic recovery are stability and certainty going forward. A yes vote in the referendum, in his view, would inevitably cause a significant loss of momentum over the next three or four years, a critical development period in maximising recovery of our reserves. None of the optimistic projections made by him or by anybody else will be realised unless we secure that certainty going forward. And that is why Sir Ian Wood has chosen to highlight the risks of a vote for Scottish independence. Because a yes vote would not bring certainty and stability to the North Sea. Instead of a single fiscal and licensing and regulatory regime across the UK continental shelf, we would have one regime in Scottish waters and a different regime in the rest of the UK. That clearly has implications for employment in the sector, not least in Aberdeen, where there are so many companies that operate their entire UK assets uh, from the city. But it also means much time and many millions of pounds spent disaggregating the assets and liabilities of companies operating across the UK continental shelf, when that time urgently needs to be spent on creating a new approach to maximising recovery in the future. And just as it makes more sense for the offshore industry in Britain to stay together, the same applies across the economy. The United Kingdom provides Scottish business with a home market of over 60 million people. That would no longer be true in the event of independence. I received a letter the other day from Richard Lockhead, who wanted to talk to me about access to that home market for Aberdeenshire farmers. They shouldn't worry about losing preferential access in the event of a yes vote, he said, because, and I quote, Britain is a geographical term. Mm -hmm. So Thank Scottish you, farmers could still describe what they grew as produce of Britain. Well, yes, Britain is indeed the name of an island, but it is much more than that. It is also the name of a state and a culture and a country which we share with our closest neighbours and friends. Those who work in Scotland's food and drink sector have to make a choice, just like those who work in our oil economy and everyone else who has a vote next Budget, month. Please. A choice to stay together, to renew our union, to seek to make it stronger and better in the years ahead, or alternatively, to listen to Mr Salmond and walk away. It is a choice not just for this generation, but for the generations to come. And I look forward to the majority of the people of Scotland next month voting no. Thank you, Kenneth Gibson, to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And despite uh, Alistair Darling's re uh, refusal to admit Scotland could be a successful independent nation during the recent televised debate, other prominent unionist politicians, including the Prime Minister David Cameron, accept that Scotland could be a successful independent nation. And how do we know? Because he said so. Supporters of independence will always be able to cite examples of small, independent and thriving economies across Europe, such as Finland, Switzerland and Norway. It would be wrong to suggest that Scotland could not be another such successful independent country. And yet the Labour amendment leaves out everything after agrees in the Scottish Government motion, including that first line which says, agrees that Scotland is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, is rich in human talent and benefits from vast natural resources. Other unionist am amendments, sadly, are in similar vein. I wonder, presiding officer, what makes them so unable or unwilling to see the obvious positives in their own country. Don't they believe we are rich in human talent? Why can't they not acknowledge our vast natural resources? Scotland is the 14th wealthiest nation in the OECD, and there is no doubt Scotland is a dynamic and successful economy. Highly skilled workforce, strong manufacturing, tourism, knowledge and growing food and drink sectors. 
The most recent industry figures show that turnover in the Scottish food and drink sector alone reached £14 billion in 2012, a 40% increase since 2007. And it's no wonder that over the last five years, Scotland's finances were stronger than the UK's as a whole by £8.3 billion, or £1,600 per person. And undoubtedly, one of the reasons why Standard & Poor's rating agency stated that, even excluding North Sea oil output, Scotland would qualify for our highest economic assessment. Of course, it would be foolish to underplay the importance of our oil and gas resources, something that the doomsayers have strived to do since the No campaign began, not least today. New discoveries in the Clearfield suggest there is plenty of life in Scotland's oil and gas industry. And as BBC News pointed out, oil industry experts have described it as a monster field containing an estimated 8 billion barrels of oil. And some analysts believe oil produced there could see the Atlantic overtake the North Sea as the UK's biggest oil producing region. Only the No campaign would try to persuade Scotland that oil is a burden and nuclear weapons that have hindered exploration and exploitation of fossil fuels in the West, as Michael Heseltine admitted last week, are an asset. So why do we have some of the highest levels of child poverty <coughs> in the Western world? Why are working families relying on food handouts? Why is our state pension among the lowest in Europe relative to earnings? And why do people living in an oil, gas and renewables rich nation suffer fuel poverty? And why have living standards fallen in each of the five, last five years and will not reach 2002 levels until 2019? Because welfare, pensions, energy and defence policies are controlled by Westminster. To me, it's obvious obvious that decisions made in Scotland for Scotland must surely be better for the people living here than decisions made elsewhere on our behalf. Only with a yes vote can we ensure Scotland's wealth is placed in Scotland's hands and used to improve our society. Only with a yes vote can we use the powers of independence to establish policies tailored to Scottish needs and create more opportunities for the people who live here, including nearly 40,000 young people who feel the need to leave Scotland every year. With independence, Scotland would have access to Scottish taxes, which currently flow to the Treasury, and cease to pay for Scottish MPs and their share of running the House of Lords or Trident. With independence, even relatively small changes could make a big difference. According to aviation industry leaders, for example, the abolition of air passenger duty would double the number of visitors to Scotland within five years, greatly enhancing our international connectivity and bolstering our tourism industry and all the jobs that go along with that. The Scottish Government's transformational childcare proposals will lead to increased participation in the labour market, further expanding our economy, and the opportunity to make Scotland wealthier is alone an argument for Scotland to reassert itself as an independent nation. However, there are consequences of remaining shackled to Westminster. According to Oxfam, Britain's five richest families are now worth more than the poorest 12 million people. And in the years ahead, welfare cuts will see more disabled people in Scotland losing disability benefits and more children pushed into poverty. Adam Smith said, no society can surely be flourishing and happy, of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. Canon Kenyon Wright outlined his concerns about the impact of a no vote in this week's Scotsman. He said, don't be fooled by the various vague promises of more devolution. The press called me the godfather of devolution. Well, I tell you this, the child has grown up and outgrown devolution, no matter how max, for two reasons. Firstly, because it leaves crucial constitutional and economic areas to be decided by London. Secondly, because devolution is power by gift, or perhaps it is really power on loan, for gifts cannot be taken back. Power devolved is power retained. In yesterday's Herald, Alan Taylor wrote that all the fresh, innovative, imaginative ideas have come from those eager for change. They are the ones who want to make a fairer, more equitable society and who have inspired people to become involved in the hope of making that happen. Final they message. have made an often selfless investment. The same cannot be said of many on the no side. What they want to do is to protect what they have. For those in the Yes, came, yes campaign, the referendum is not about protecting vested interests. It is about Scotland, our country and our people being all that it and they can be. It is surely time, colleagues, that Scotland rejoined the family of independent nations and set about creating a bit, the better Scotland we all wish to, say, to see. To do that, I urge everyone in our country to vote yes on 18th of September. Thank you. I now call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The First Minister began by saying that the referendum debate has re-energised Scottish politics, and I believe that's true. An outpouring of ideas and enthusiasm, as he said, and also the need, which has been recognised by people on both sides of the debate today, to retain that energy, that engagement uh, after the vote. I believe that Scotland can be proud 
of the debate that's been taking place. What's made that true is not always us debating here in this room. It's not politicians, political parties, large or small. It's the broad, creative, inclusive national debate that's been taking place in communities right across Scotland. That's the debate that I think Scotland can be proud of. In thinking about how to retain that energy, that engagement and creativity after the debate, I think there's one thing that we can be clear about. It won't be achieved if politicians on either side, whoever wins or loses, pull up the drawbridge and decide that they know what Scotland wants. The engagement has to continue in a participative sense, ensuring that all people feel able to shape Scotland's future direction. There have been those saying that this debate in some way will cut us off from one another within our own communities or from friends and families south of the border. I don't think anything could be further from the truth. Bringing us more into connection with the question of power in our society gives us the ability to build the kind of relationship that will be beneficial to all. I spoke recently to Green colleagues in London, a range of Green Party and other activists from England and Wales, looking at the opportunity, opportunity for democratic renewal throughout these islands that could come from Scottish independence, looking at the opportunity to question the existence and the renewal of weapons of mass destruction within these islands that could come from Scottish independence, looking at the opportunities for a clean renewable energy system that could come from Scotland ensuring that we harness the renewable energy potential, not just for our own needs, but for export as well. There are opportunities for a better relationship within these islands, not just for Scots to make decisions about our own domestic affairs. Either in the case of a yes or a no, there is a danger that politicians on the winning side will feel triumphalist and decide that they know exactly what is best, either in favour of one flavour of Devo Max or another in the case of a no vote. Well, I have friends and party colleagues who may be voting no in this referendum. None of them are voting no because they're signed up to one of these, in my view, slightly dubious versions of Devo Max that have come from the UK political parties, which seem to me designed not to transfer the ability to run different economic policy in Scotland, but rather to transfer the responsibility to implement the cuts which would come from ideological austerity economics south of the border. But I also have friends and colleagues, most of my party colleagues, like myself, who will be voting yes in September. And we may be voting yes in sympathy with some of the elements in these famous 650 answers, but not for all of them. We'll be voting yes on the basis of a question. Everyone in this room, every voter in this country will be voting yes or no on the basis of a question printed in black and white on the ballot paper should Scotland be an independent country. It would be undermining of that ethos of participative, engaging, re-engaging uh, political debate that we've enjoyed in the last few months if a winning side in either scenario pulled up the drawbridge and said we know what to do next on every question. A mandate for questions on currently reserved issues will be sought in 2016 if we're independent. It is not what is being sought next month. On issues, for example, discussed today, such as oil, the Greens will never agree with governments, whether in Edinburgh or in London, who simply want to in ensure the conditions to maximise oil and gas extraction, burning through the stuff ever faster. There is an absolute contradiction between the goal of extracting fossil fuels from the North Sea ever faster and the goal of keeping carbon fossil out of the atmosphere, which both governments, North and South, have committed to. Final minute. And the exposure of our economy, not just in Scotland, but in the whole of the UK and much of the Western world, the exposure of our economies to the carbon bubble, this dramatically overvalued industry, which is sitting on reserves four or five times more than we can afford ever to burn. That's a bubble that we need to break our reliance on before it bursts. 
Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, the last point I want to make, and I am sure that it is one we can all agree with. I certainly hope so. It is not so very long since we gathered in our temporary home up at the top of the Royal Mile to mourn the passing of our friend Margaret MacDonald and to hear her call for us to treat one another perhaps as opponents but never as enemies in this debate. In these last few weeks, every one of us have a responsibility to remember that every day that we get out of bed and go into the communities that we represent in Scotland to continue this debate. And we've got a responsibility to remember it every day as we end our campaigning to treat one another with respect and have this debate in the spirit of friendship that Scotland deserves. Thank you very much. Joan McAlpine to be followed by Alex Riley. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's very telling um, that in drafting their amendments, the Better Together parties could not find it in themselves to leave the first clause of the Government motion in place, that this Parliament agrees Scotland is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, rich in human talent and benefit from vast natural resources. Whatever their views on the Constitution, I would have thought that we could all agree that Scotland is a wealthy country, that it is rich in talent and it has vast uh, natural resources. Because, providing officer, that statement is rooted in fact and backed up by countless authorities which have been quoted by colleagues today. The Financial Times on the 2nd of February this year said that Scotland is richer than the rest of the UK and in the top 20 countries globally in terms of GDP per head. Only yesterday, the world's most preeminent economist, Nobel Prize winning Professor Joe Stiglitz, told Bloomberg that Scotland could be an independent country. And I was also encouraged to hear Professor Stiglitz acknowledge the different directions that the Scottish and Westminster governments were taking in his view in terms of social policy, with the Scottish Government having a far greater commitment to social democratic values and public services. Professor Stiglitz's book is called The Price of Inequality, so he knows what he's talking about. And this is the best opportunity to address inequality. A yes vote is the best opportunity we'll ever have to address that inequality. I want to talk today in particular about the geographical inequality which pulls our young people out of Scotland towards London and the South East. I have on several occasions had the pleasure of speaking beside Dr Philippa Whitford, the consultant breast surgeon who is one of the most inspirational figures in the grassroots movement for yes which has brought our country alive in recent months. Dr Whitford is one of a growing number of clinicians to speak out about the threat to the Scottish NHS from the privatisation agenda in England, which my colleague Aileen MacLeod outlined. But there's another observation that Philippa makes, which is very striking as she speaks to full halls all over the country. Most of our patients are older women, and like any good doctor, she will ask them what support they have at home to help them to recuperate from surgery. Far too often they tell her they have no support because their grown-up children have moved away, uh, sometimes abroad, more often to the south of England. As the First Minister said in his speech, Scotland loses almost 40,000 young people every year and they are our brightest and best. According to recent figures from ONS, Scotland has the best educated population in Europe, not just in terms of the high proportion of people with degrees, but also the high number of people with good vocational qualifications. So in an area that this Parliament fully controls, education, we have established ourselves as a world leader. But in an area that we don't control, which is eco economic and fiscal policy, we are victims of our success in education because we cannot provide the sort of jobs that these highly educated and ambitious young people want. This is not a new trend. Professor Tom Devine, our most eminent historian, who, as my colleague Aileen McLeod said, uh, has come out for yes, like so many other Scots, has written in his book, The Scottish Diaspora, about the union dividend, which uh, has resulted in a huge mass migration from Scotland. Scotland was the only country of similar sized European countries, Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden and Ireland, to have a falling population between 1950 and 2000. Now, that has reversed under this present parliament. But we need to do so much more because... The outward migration of our young people is greater um, than other parts of the UK, and that was partly because of the Pool of London. Eight out of ten new jobs in the private sector are created in London, and it's the sort of jobs that are created in London that are attracting our young people. London has 14% more jobs in the top employment categories of managers, professionals and technical staff in Scotland, an imbalance that's existed for many years. 
Business research and development in the UK is concentrated in the east and southeast of England, a pattern that has held since at least 1990. And Scotland has a very low business R&D spend at 0.5% of GDP. Uh, this explains why Scotland, despite being one of the richest countries in the world, according to the Financial Times, is still losing its best talent. And it explains why, even when Scotland is doing relatively well economically, we are one of the best performing areas for inward investment, according to Ernst & Young. Even in these better times, we are losing a high proportion of our young people to outward migration. We need the fiscal levers that are reserved to Westminster and we need the Scottish tax revenues that flow to Westminster to keep our most precious resource of all, the aspirational young Scots who leave in search of a better life. If I can quote the economist Margaret Cuthbert, these things are only going to get worse. She says that the regional disparities in the UK are not some short-term phenomenon, rather they are a result of the fast-growing South, particularly London and the city, acting as a magnet for capital and labour from other parts of the UK. Final minute. If I can borrow a rather more colourful phrase from the Coalition's Business Secretary, Vince Cable, London's a giant suction machine swallowing up not just Scotland's wealth, but our future wealth creators. That's why I am urging a yes vote, because independence is the greatest opportunity we have to combat the power of that giant suction machine described so vividly by Mr Cable. We can do it in several ways, and we've outlined over the last weeks and months uh, several plans for growth, such as the reindustrialisation of uh, Scotland and the jobs plan, which means that by taking our uh, economy into our own hands and our future into our own hands, we can create a much better future for our young people and keep them here in Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now call Alex Rowley to be followed by Stuart Maxwell. Uh, presiding officer, um, I only came into this parliament in January uh, this year um, under circumstances certainly that, that I didn't want. But I'm actually delighted that we've got to this point today and I'll be more delighted when we get to the 19th of September regardless of the result because I think we can then start to focus on what I came into this parliament to do, which was to fight for, for the communities that I represent and to fight for a better Scotland. And I found it very difficult to be able to do that over this last period of time because the whole focus seems to have been on this referendum, regardless of your views on that. I certainly have never had any problem in terms of my identity. I was brought up a Fifer and I've always been proud to be a Fifer. And I was brought up by my mum, who... who, who without having any type of label, I think it would be fair to describe as a socialist. She brought me up to believe that we had to fight for better opportunities for working people, and that working people had never got anything for nothing, and we had always had to fight for it. It would be fair to say that, that, that my mum was not um, keen on the Tories, and probably neither, neither have I been. And that's the starting point for me in terms of looking at how we move forward and, and, and what's best in this debate. And as Joan McAlpine talks about the talent going south, what angers me, and I think angers so many people, is when we see the masses of young people across Scotland that are the precious resource to Scotland that don't get the opportunities. Surely, if we're talking about ambition for Scotland, then our ambition has got to be that every child, no matter what household they were born into, no matter what area they're born into, are given the opportunity to achieve to their full potential. Surely it's about eradicating poverty and deprivation right across Scotland, and that's got to be the key objective that we fight for. Tough on poverty, tough on the causes of poverty. But when I look round about me and I examine the, the last seven years of this current government, I do have to say that in Fife, in the last two and a half years of a Labour administration, I've seen more direction, more policy and more political leadership towards tackling poverty poverty and equality and giving young people the opportunity than I actually have seen in the seven years of the, 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 the government led by, by Alex Salmond. And so for me it's about investing in housing. Surely every child should have the right to have a roof over their head. Yet we've seen over the last seven years the monies that is coming into housing for local authorities actually being cut back. Surely it's about early intervention, family intervention, family intervention 
Convention, and in Fife, one of the first things the Labour Administration did two and a half years ago was redirect £8 million into family centres, focusing on those in the greatest need. You can bring about populist policies that will make you popular with everybody, or you can look at prioritising and directing your resources at the communities, at the schools, at the areas that most need them. And that's what there has been a lack of. So when, when I think about this issue, I think about where best are we in terms of moving forward and how best will we tackle the priorities for me. And I conclude that the way to do that is by pooling and sharing the resources across the United Kingdom, a strong Scottish Parliament here, where we actually use the powers that we have, because that's the other point that needs to be made. I have yet to see a whole range of powers that this Parliament currently has that we could be using to tackle inequality across Scotland actually be used at the present time and tough on the causes of poverty. Joan McAlpine. I thank the member for taking an intervention. Uh, you talk about the pooling of resources across the United Kingdom. Uh, the UK welfare cuts are going to take six billion out of uh, the Scottish uh, welfare budget and result in up to 100,000 children being plunged into poverty. How does he see that as a fair pooling of resources? Alex Shirley. I would say to you that under the last Labour government, there was over a million pensioners lifted out of poverty across the United Kingdom. Many of these pensioners in Scotland, I remember, I remember under the last Tory government where pensioners were having to choose between heat and eating, um, and that, that's not acceptable. Over 200,000 children were lifted out of poverty in Scotland. I remember, I remember as, a, as a teenager, as a shop steward in Newpe, the public sector union campaigning for the national minimum wage and being told at that time, even by some trade unionists, that it would never happen. It did happen, and it happened under a Labour government. So I believe, I believe that what we need to have is as, as a poverty strategy for Scotland. We've got to devolve powers into local government. We've got to actually, I would have to say, look at this place again, because I'm not convinced that this place that we're in today actually is working to, to create joined-up government that will tackle inequality, will tackle poverty. So for me, the best opportunity to actually tackle the big issues and get every youngster in Scotland the best chance in life is a strong Scottish Parliament focused on doing that as part of a strong United Kingdom. My final point is that I think I would describe myself not just as a socialist but as an internationalist and we need to be looking outward, not inward at a time when we have so many problems right across the world. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Stuart Maxwell to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, four weeks from today, the people of Scotland will decide between two futures. We can vote no and accept the consequences of leaving our National Health Service in the hands of Westminster parties that are intent on cuts, austerity, health charges and the privatisation of our NHS. We will have to also have to accept the years of austerity and the damage to our cherished public services that will flow from the £25 billion of cuts that will be implemented by the UK Government, irrespective, irrespective of which party forms that Government after the 2015 UK general election. All the people of Scotland can choose to vote yes and take Scotland's future into Scotland's hands. We can choose to protect our NHS from the market-driven ideology of the Westminster parties that is unpicking the NHS south of the border. We can choose to rid our country of the wasteful and immoral weapons of mass destruction that, 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 that spoil our country. We can choose to invest in transformational childcare policies for families across Scotland. And we can choose to have an education system that is based on the ability to learn and not the ability to pay. Now, I consider it a great privilege to be part of the historic events currently taking place in Scotland. But I know there are those in this chamber who would rather none of this was taking place. That having a democratic debate and a passionate discussion about Scotland's future and how we can create a better society is somehow a distraction. It's just a wee thing. Now, I would challenge those members to recall any other time in recent memory where town and village halls have been filled with people wanting to re-engage with the democratic process, where talk of what we can do has replaced the depressing dirge of what we can't. This enthusiasm is because the independence debate is opening up new possibilities about how we can create a fairer and more prosperous society. 
how we can take the vast wealth of Scotland and make it work for the many and not just the few. Certainly. Joanne Lamont. I'm happy to concur with the, the, the member that, in fact, this has been a very exciting and energetic debate, and it's a democratic debate. Will the member confirm that he will accept the result of that vote? If there's a no vote, you'll make devolution work. Stuart Maxwell. We have always said that we will accept the democratic decision of the Scottish people. And I'm surprised that Joanne Lamont yet again has to ask such a really rather silly question. People feel, people feel a newfound sense of empowerment. They are waking up to the opportunities of independence and are realising that Scotland is not a poor country, but is in fact one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Wealthier by head than countries such as France or Japan and wealthier than the rest of the UK. But it doesn't feel that way and it often doesn't look that way. These newfound feelings of opportunity, of hope, of ambition contrast sharply with the disempowerment and stagnation of the Westminster system. After all, this is a system that regularly imposes Tory governments on Scotland without any democratic mandate from the Scottish people. Scotland's future must be in Scotland's hands. Our Parliament has already shown that where we have the power, we make the best decisions for Scotland. And nowhere is this more evident than in our education system. Whilst we have adhered to the principle of access to education based on the ability to learn, not the ability to pay, Westminster is burdening English students with fees of up to £9,000 a year. A certain trust report concluded that many students will still be repaying loans into their 40s and 50s and that some will never clear their debts. But having a bit of power over a bit of the system is akin to being a boxer fighting with one hand tied behind his back. He might strike the odd blow, but ultimately he cannot win. Our lack of macroeconomic power means that more than 700,000 Scots have immigrated in the last 10 years, including over 30,000 young people a year. We need to ensure that we not only continue to be a world leader in education, but that the Scottish Parliament has the economic levers to create opportunities for our young people here, here at home in Scotland. If people choose to travel the world to seek out new opportunities and experiences, that is absolutely fantastic. But if they are forced to leave, splitting up families because they can only find work elsewhere, then that is a failure. That is a disgrace. Watching your grandchildren grow up via Skype is not the kind of future I want for the families of Scotland. The No campaign continually used the negative language of splits and separation to describe the universally recognised normal state others call independence. But the truth is that independence will provide us with the opportunities to keep families together. It will allow young people to choose to stay and work here in Scotland, near to their families, if that is what they choose to do. However, Westminster's damage has extended beyond its failure to balance economic opportunities across the UK. The UK government has also made it increasingly difficult for international students to study here. Professor Wright of Strathclyde University said the UK government policy on international students was a disaster, which made us less competitive. International students contribute hundreds of millions of pounds to the economy every year. Yet Westminster's ideologically driven immigration policy is putting this at risk. To prevent further damage to our economy and to our higher education sector, Scotland needs a yes vote and the transfer of powers over immigration to here, to the Scottish Parliament. Every day on the doorsteps and in the public meetings across Scotland, we are seeing that more and more people are waking up to the opportunities of independence. Thank you, George, close, please. Presiding officer, this referendum is about many things, but fundamentally it is about the desire to seize the opportunity of a lifetime, to choose between two futures that could not be more different, to decide whether to leave our future in the hands of Westminster or to bring power over Scotland home to Scotland. This is no wee thing. All three generations of my family are united in saying close, we please. choose hope over fear. We choose Scotland over Westminster. And on September the 18th, we choose yes. Now call on Ken McIntosh to be followed by Annabel Ewing up to six minutes as we're very tight for time. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, there have been too many political funerals over the last year. I was saddened at Sam, D Sam Galbraith's death earlier this week, and he was a combative politician. Uh, but some have managed to be both spiky and very likeable at the same time. And his death got me thinking of how far we have travelled since those heady days of the new Scottish Parliament in 1999. We've, we may have recently have forgotten it, but the early days and early years of devolution were marked by a sense of common purpose 
and a willingness to work together. The huge expansion of nursery education, the introduction of free personal care, the growing self-confidence that allowed us to ban smoking in public places, these are all products of devolution, and I note of devolution within the United Kingdom, not of independence. In fact, it struck me in passing, and SNB backbenchers may find this hard to believe, but there was, that was also a time when John Swinney, Nicola Sturgeon and their cabinet colleagues were amongst the staunchest advocates of a strong Scottish Parliament holding a potentially overbearing executive to account. How times change, presiding officer. But that train of thought took me straight as it did with uh, Patrick Harvey earlier, to the very moving celebration of Margot Macdonald's life, and in particular her parting message read by her husband Jim Sillers, appealing whatever the result of the referendum in four weeks' time, for any divisions to end and for us as a nation to seek unity of purpose. It is a message I have taken comfort from, both in the face of uh, the occasional bad-tempered spat or ill-judged intervention, and also, I admit, when struggling to contain my own frustration at what I often feel is the, the pointlessness of the offer before us. What I have found even more encouraging is that underneath the froth of constitutional discussion, I can see common themes underpinning many of the contributions from both sides and a meaningful, achievable political vision for Scotland's future around which we could coalesce post-September. Those themes, ideas which support us building a modern, progressive country, are echoed by voices from Civic Scotland. For example, the recent publication, Our Vision, from the Church of Scotland, talks about its commitment to ensuring issues of social justice will be a focus of action after September, regardless of what happens. The STUC, in its A Just Scotland report, similarly talks about equality and the collective values of the labour and trade union movement. And I thought the teachers' union, the EIS, put it very well when they said, we are not neutral... We firmly believe that it is imperative that emerges a strong sense of the type of Scotland we wish to live in, irrespective of the constitutional settlement. Presenting officer, many observers in a second, perhaps. Presenting officer, many political observers have commented that the SNP has tried to reinvent itself over the last couple of decades as a party of the social democratic left. Now, I've highlighted before my misgivings that populism is as powerful a force within the SNP as genuine progressivism. But nonetheless, the fact is that ministers feel obliged to use the language of progressive politics simply to ensure their assertions on the Constitution have a chance of being heard. Some contributions, such as the repeated and increasingly desperate attempts to trade in the legacy of Nye Bevan, are slightly cringeworthy, but they are a recognition of where both mainstream and majority political opinion lies in Scotland. Even though the results of the 2011 election might not necessarily suggest it, most analysts viewed the Labour and SNP manifestos at the time as remarkably similar documents. And the point I want to emphasise, the point I want to emphasise, Presiding Officer, is that there is much in the way of common ground between Labour and the SNP. Claire Adams. I absolutely agree with Mr McIntosh. There is much, much that binds us in our, our history and experiences, and indeed I come from a very similar background to, the, to that of his colleague, Mr Rowley. Does it not concern him that his colleague Roy Hattersley on Radio 4 this week said that he did not think the Labour governments or Blair and Brown had been real Labour governments? Because when he now challenges the Tories about the consequences of soft-touch banking and the damaging welfare reforms, he's told they were started under the Labour governments. And the only chance for Labour values to be reflected in the governance of this country is through an independence vote. Yes. Ken McIntosh. Unfortunately, despite my attempts, Claire Adamson makes a, a very small party political point rather than rising to the constitutional debate we're having before us today. I, 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 recognise, I recognise it is difficult to put political tribalism behind us, but I, I am actually appealing to the SNP to try and do so after September the 18th. It will be difficult for members in the Labour Party too, because many supporters and members of the party are cynical about the SNP's commitment to progressive politics and see it simply as a means to an end, a nationalist vision for Scotland. But many of us across Scotland, across political parties, are agreed, not just on the necessity, but on the political importance, the political priority we should give reducing inequality that divides our society, on the priority we need to give to promoting a sustainable economy, on decent jobs, a more caring society, supporting education, not just as the route out of poverty, but the route to genuine national prosperity, on the emphasis on common well-being, not just on wealth. Now, presenting officer, constitutional change is not a prerequisite for agreeing 
any of the above. In fact, I believe it's clear to most Scots that it's not only do we not need independence to deliver progressive change, breaking away from the United Kingdom would positively damage our chances. Separation would threaten the very social solidarity we are trying to build. It would create new divisions rather than heal existing ones. Presenting officer, I think we can unite in pursuit of a better Scotland, but let's not break up the NHS. Let's not give up our currency. We don't Must need close, independence please. to deliver childcare. Let us vote no thanks and deliver a better Scotland together. Thank you so much. And I now call on Annabel Ewing to be followed by Annabel Goldie. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And it is an absolute privilege to have been called to speak in this key debate this afternoon on Scotland's future for what a momentous moment we have arrived at in our country when just in just four weeks' time we will have the one opportunity of a lifetime to decide what kind of country we want to live in and what kind of country we wish to build for future generations. And indeed, on Thursday, 18 September, we, each of us, will have the opportunity to make a choice between two futures, a Scotland that controls her vast resources and puts them to use to build a better, more prosperous and fairer Scotland, or a Scotland whose decisions continue to be taken by out-of-touch Westminster governments we do not vote for, who place a ceiling on our ambitions and who squander our resources. Aspiration and ambition for something better, presiding officer, or the same old, same old from Westminster. That is the choice of two futures facing all of the people who live and work in Scotland on the 18th of uh, September. Many areas of importance, presiding officer, to our daily lives have been discussed already this afternoon and in the time remaining for me, I would like as a member of this Parliament's Welfare Reform Committee to direct my remarks to the important issue of welfare. And what has emerged very clearly from the inception of the work of this committee over the last two years or so is that the welfare system, still sadly controlled by Westminster, is no longer fit for purpose. Indeed, it is being dismantled before our very eyes with the safety net that should be embodied within it being removed by stealth. For what other conclusion could be reached by people, people at home with the notion of the common wheel when we look at the deeply damaging impacts of so-called welfare reform on individuals and families across Scotland? For who could not feel diminished as a human being by Westminster policies that force those with motor neuron disease to take in a lodger to avoid paying the bedroom tax or harass recently bereaved widows to leave their home of many decades because their UK government says that they have too many rooms. And I do see the Tory front bench laughing, as they did in the debate last week. I don't think that's funny. I don't think that the lady who came to our committee to give evidence on that very issue thought it was funny. Who could not feel diminished by Westminster's work capability assessments, introduced, of course, by the last Labour government, with the help of Tony Blair's friend, the Tory uh, Lord Freud, and kept on by the Tories, which assessments turn medical orthodoxies on their head by finding vulnerable ill people somehow fit for work and forcing them to go through hoops in an effort to maintain their health, their sanity and indeed their dignity. And who would not feel diminished by Westminster government policies that will see over 100,000 disabled Scots lose some or all of their disability benefits as a result of the rollout of the new personal independence payment, a benefit introduced by the current UK Tory Liberal government and one that Labour plan to keep. Of course, presiding officer, a welfare system should have the objective of supporting people into work and work that is paid at a decent rate. But at the same time, who would wish to choose a society where a bit of help was to be taken away from some of the most vulnerable members of our society. But that presiding officer is the miserable, rotten place where we have reached under the union. And that is, for me, the unacceptable price that our most vulnerable members of society, our poorest members of society, are now paying for the union. For presiding officer, a country as rich as Scotland, more wealthy per head than the UK, than France, than Japan, and yet we have seen 22,387 children having to rely on food banks in order to be able to eat in the last year alone. A country with vast, vast resources, both in terms of human talent and natural uh, resources, and yet we will see if we stay on the Westminster path, 100,000 more children being pushed into poverty by 2020. It does not have to be this way, and we, each of us, cannot in all conscience allow it to continue to be so. 
This is the opportunity of a lifetime, the opportunity to say that we want a decent society, a society with fairness at its heart. That, presiding officer, is what voting yes means. That is what voting yes is about. And that is what voting yes will deliver for Scotland. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Now I call on Annabel Goldie to be followed by Rob Gibson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is an important day for this Parliament because whatever the outcome of the referendum, this Parliament will change. And when we meet again in this chamber after 18 September, Scotland will have decided her future. Either she will have rejected the United Kingdom and endorsed separation, or she will have rejected separation and endorsed the United Kingdom. And it's right that in this place, of all places, we today mark the magnitude of that decision by holding this debate. Presiding officer, it's important to be clear what this referendum is not about. It's not about can Scotland be independent. It can. It's not about um, whether um, we are doing down independence or whether we are talking up the union. It's quite simply about what's a better future for Scotland. It's not about whether you like or dislike Tories, Labour or the Lib Dems, however much some of the Yes campaign may want to reduce it to that. And this referendum is most certainly not about who is the better Scot, who is the bigger patriot. We all believe in our country, we all love our country, and we are all fighting for what we believe is the best future for Scotland. Alex Salmond, he believes separation is patriotic. I believe partnership is patriotic. And very importantly, this referendum is not a choice between independence and no change. David Cameron, Ed Miliband and Nick Clegg have all committed to including more powers to the Scottish Parliament in their manifestos and to delivering on that in government. This Parliament will get more powers. Which is why, which is why, certainly, Mr. Yeah, Immediate. Baroness Goldie for taking the intervention. You rightly say that the Unionist parties have committed to saying that there shall be more powers for the Scottish Parliament guaranteed. Can you tell us which ones and when? Well, Anna that will be very much down to the electorate to decide which parties' proposals they favour. The common theme in all of them, the common theme in all of them is more powers to this Parliament. Yes. Presiding officer, in the time allocated, I cannot deliver a forensic and lengthy dissertation on the merits, attributes, strength, stability and security implicit within the partnership, which is the United Kingdom. But I don't have to. The case for staying within the United Kingdom is so compelling, so self-evident, brevity is all I need. A partnership. A partnership of over 60 million friends and customers working with each other for each other. A partnership with over 30 million people paying taxes and contributing jointly to our common good. A partnership where businesses, not least the financial sector, can invest and operate freely because of a UK-wide system of regulation. A partnership which in a global age gives us a global reach in the United Nations, in the G7 and G8 groups of major uh, powers, along with the EU, helping others less fortunate. A partnership which in an age of international uncertainty gives us a strategic defence capability and a global diplomatic presence. And a partnership which has an established, proven and respected currency, the pound. In all of that, is strength, stability and security. Now, Alex Hammond doesn't want that. He wants separation, an irrevocable, irreversible step. There are two certainties about Mr. Salmon, and I'm sorry he's not here to share this peon of praise. The two certainties are his passion, his enthusiasm for what he wants, and his complete and utter inability to tell the rest of us what we'll get. What will be our currency? He doesn't know. Will we have a central bank to support it? He doesn't know. When will we get into the EU? He doesn't know. What conditions will be imposed on our membership? He doesn't know. How will we pay for pensions in an increasingly ageing population? He doesn't know. How many thousands of defence jobs in Scotland will be lost? He doesn't know. What will be our credit rating? He doesn't know. What is the effect of our biggest trading partner becoming our biggest commercial competitor? He doesn't know. How will Scotland deal with a continuing budget deficit? He doesn't know. Will he cut expenditure or put up taxes or do both? He doesn't know. And if it all goes belly up, what do we do? Who do we turn to? He doesn't know. Deputy Residing Officer, I have compared this gamble to being asked to put your life savings on a 100 to 1 outsider with a limp on the 330 at air. And given the recent Given the recent telling interventions from Sir Ian Wood and Dr Anna McGregor, the odds have just lengthened. 
Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, I am not going to take a punt on Scotland's future. On 18 September, I shall choose partnership and say no to separation. I shall choose mutual support and say no to severance. I shall choose union and say no to isolation. I shall choose certainty and say no to risk. Because, Deputy Presiding Officer, I do have the best of both worlds. I know that, and so do hundreds of thousands of voters the length and breadth of Scotland. And on the 18th of September, united and together, we shall reject independence. Thank you very much. I now call on Rob Gibson to be followed by Margaret McCullough. Up to six minutes, please. Well, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the choices today are of hope and opportunity with independence, while austerity and indifference to Scottish needs characterise so many of the policies of the unionist parties. How dare Scotland vote to end poverty and create a fairer nation for rural and urban Scots alike? It was ever thus. When the radical young Robert Bontine Cunningham Graham MP was arguing in the House of Commons in 1889 about Scottish Home Rule, he suggested that the demand came not from a sentimental ground whatever, but from the extreme misery of a certain section of the Scottish population, and they wished to have their own ministers under their own hands in order to extort legislation from them suitable to relieve that misery. In 2004, I commented on this. Over a century later, that misery takes startlingly similar forms, such as a lack of steady work, poor health, shortage of decent housing, serial misuse of our land and sea resources, and yet more unwanted wars. Just yesterday, the Poverty and Social Inclusion Project confirmed that misery continues. The Poverty Alliance Director Peter Kelly said, it should not be the case in 21st century Scotland. One in four adults had skimped on their own food to ensure others in the household eat. The fact that 30,000 children in Scotland live in families who cannot afford to feed themselves properly is a national disgrace. Food banks are the mark of misery today from Wick to Wigtonshire. It shows a fair share of our resources does not exist. For example, Half of rural Scotland is in the hands of around 430 people. In response, the Land Reform Review Group's report, The Land of Scotland and the Common Good, shows how to end speculation in our land and to put that land into the hands of our people to feed and house us and sustain the nation. Land reform has progressed in part under devolution, but independence is needed if we are to control tax avoidance, property trusts based in tax havens and tax powers to incentivise better land use. These are conspicuously absent from the unionists' list of more powers if we vote no. Westminster has never shown the slightest wish to relinquish tax powers that are fundamental to our most basic needs and resources. And what of food production? The scandal of the CAP Settlement brokered by the UK in Europe shows how limited Scotland's devolved powers are. Scotland gets a lower average rate per hectare than any other member state in Europe or the rest of the UK itself in basic payments. The same goes for rural development. Scots farmers and crofters will lose a billion pounds of you, a billion euros before 2020 because we aren't at the top table. Despite this, Scotland's food and drink under the SNP government has produced the third highest per capita output in Europe, with only Iceland and Ireland ahead of us. With independence, we can fully promote our food and drink overseas and properly resource export certificates, unlike the UK's dilatory bureaucracy. Beside an officer, clean energy is key for rural and island Scotland. Our renewables already supply almost half of Scotland's electricity demand. This more than doubles our output since 2007, aiming to banish fuel poverty, one of the three major markers of deprivation hitting the old in rural housing hardest. The renewable industry has wide general public support, despite the scare stories of the Better Together campaign between January 2010 
and April 2013, it has announced £13.1 billion of investment, promising 9,100 renewable jobs across Scotland, which benefits local contractors, shops and hotels, and build our economic resilience. Westminster, unlike the Scottish Government, is gung-ho for fracking and offers a huge support package for new nuclear power at Hinkley Point. With a no vote, would they try to dump the waste in Scotland? With Scotland's energy wealth, consumers shouldn't face rising prices, the misery of fuel poverty and the risk that our renewable energy ambitions will be thwarted. We need a smooth functioning energy market. We need uh, Westminster to listen to this and to join in with us rather than ignore us. Underinvestment in energy generation over decades has led to a looming security of supply crisis, most of all in England. Presiding officer, off the shores of my constituency in the Pentland Firth, we have infinite tidal power. This is a symbol of opportunity compared to the lack of ambition in Westminster. Let's turn these days of hope into years of opportunity with a tidal wave of yes votes. It's an honour to support the First Minister's motion today. I now call on Margaret McCullough to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. The decision we make in just a few weeks' time has been described as the biggest political decision for Scotland in 300 years. It is indeed the opportunity of a lifetime. It's our opportunity to settle this constitutional question once and for all. As been said between now and Poland Day, my Labour colleagues and I will be campaigning for a no vote because we believe that what we achieve, we achieve more when we pull together. And when the votes are counted and the results are declared, we will accept the judgment of the people of Scotland, whatever they have decided. And I hope that others will respect the judgment of the people, even if the vote doesn't go their way next month either. Of course, when we say the referendum is a big decision, it's not just because of the ramifications it may have, whatever the final result, but also because of the level of turnout and what those might be. Estimates of 80% have been quoted in the press, and we have to go back to the 1950s to find a turnout figure that has exceeded 80% in a general election. I won't predict what the level of voter participation might be, but like most people, I expect it to surpass the last general election, and even if it doesn't match the most optimist optimistic estimates. The operation we are expecting in the day and overnight, as well as the operation we are seeing now to get people registered and to manage postal votes in all of Scotland's 32 local authorities, is unprecedented. And the size of the operation, the scale of the decision, the nationwide effort to ensure that the people of Scotland have their say, it all just reinforces this basic point. It's not a majority in this parliament that will determine the outcome of the referendum. It's the majority in the country. On the 18th of September, the future of Scotland is indeed in the hands of Scotland's people. And we have a choice. Much of the debate has been an attempt by politicians to frame that choice for people, and understandably so. It's the purpose of a political campaign, and it's part of the unwritten job description of politicians, to persuade and convince, to make people see how our beliefs and priorities lead us to approach decisions in different ways and to come to different conclusions. Let me say, as others have done, set out what I believe the choice is really all about on the 18th of September. We could vote as the Scottish Government wish, but what we gain from independence has to be balanced against the new pressures we would face, the uncertainties that remain, and what we lose from leaving the United Kingdom. Or we could democratically decide as a nation to share power with the UK, a union in which we have representation a union that is becoming less centralised and more flexible, while still retaining its essential strength. We have a strong parliament in Scotland, growing stronger, and we are part of something bigger. 
We have a resilient economy with oil, gas and whisky and renewables, and we have an integrated market with the rest of the UK where we sell more goods and services than we do in the rest of the world. We have sweeping powers over economic development and planning, and we are part of one of the world's largest economies with a stable currency and the Bank of England behind us. What we have isn't perfect, neither what is an offer in the white paper. But in constitutional terms, we have the best of both worlds, and I believe the best of both worlds is best for Scotland. Presiding officer, most, most people who are making their minds up about the referendum next month want to do what is best for their community, best for their family, and best for the country. The Labour Amendment makes clear what we believe is best for Scotland, but is for the people to decide. I trust the judgment of the people and, whatever the decision, yes or no, when Parliament reconvenes next month, we must respect that decision and make it work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Bruce Crawford. Uh, like others, it's a privilege to be asked to speak in this final debate in the Scottish Parliament before the people of Scotland decide their future in just four short weeks' time. Of course, it has been a long campaign since the signing of the Edinburgh Agreement, which signed us all up to respect the result, by the way, in October 2012. But now we enter the end phase. From colleagues and friends I've spoken to across the political divide, there have been a range of emotions and experiences. And for myself, I can truly state this has been the most rewarding and liberating campaign I have ever been involved in. To have had the chance at this remarkable time in Scottish history to discuss now with many thousands of people the opportunities for my country's future has been a hugely uplifting experience. And I know that that feeling has been shared by many in the Yes campaign teams across the country. New and enduring friendships have been forged with people who were never before politically active. People whose lives have literally been turned around as a woman who has become a very important part of the Stirling Yes campaign told me last week. The campaign has provided her with a new positive focus on her life and given an injection of new energy she thought she would never see again. But this has only happened because she and countless others have been involved in a campaign that has tried hard to be relentlessly positive about the opportunity independence brings for Scotland. A campaign centred on hope aspiration and being all we can be will give Scotland the chance to make her mark on the world stage. A campaign, incidentally, that I am incredibly proud of. Two small words sum up for me best why I want Scotland to become an independent country. Dignity and respect. The opportunity of being able to decide our own future with the security and dignity that being in control of our own lives brings. I also want to ensure our people have a chance to live in dignity and that our children do not have to live a life of poverty. It is an unfortunate fact that no matter who people in Scotland have voted for at Westminster, the gap between the rich and the poor has only become larger. Yeah. And here we have figures, as others have said today, from organisations like the Child Poverty Action Group that tell us the result of Westminster policies we can expect to see up to another 100,000 children in poverty by 2020. This is not acceptable in modern-day Scotland. We are a rich country, and I know that no one who now seriously doubts it. But yet, if we stay on the current course, then we'll be warned what to expect. But the people of Scotland are waking up to the fact that independence provides them with the opportunity of a lifetime to change the structure of how we are governed and create a better and fairer future for all our people. Now, of course, we will make mistakes, but they'll be our mistakes, and we'll have the dignity of putting them right for ourselves. And yes, we will need to face up to the real challenges of independence we'll bring, but we will do that with the dignity of being able to tackle these challenges using our people's undoubted skills, intelligence, and ability. The dignity of being normal is all that I seek. The respect that Scotland has on the world stage matters very deeply to me and goes to the very core of why I think it's hugely important that Scotland chooses to vote yes. 
Now, of course, a yes vote will make me very happy, but it is the respect that will be gained from having a constitution for Scotland that outlaws weapons of mass destruction from our land that I seek most. Providing Scotland, and indeed the rest of the United Kingdom, with the opportunity to press the restart button on the obscenity of nuclear weapons is reason enough for me, on its own, to want independence. <laughs> the debate on whether Trident should remain on the Clyde has tended to centre on the cost, the economy, or the effect on this or otherwise as a deterrent. Yes, the cost of renewing Trident is truly abhorrent at £100 billion, and more and more strategic military experts are questioning its strategic relevance in today's world. But for me, the debate goes way beyond these parameters. I want the respect of living in a normal country, because not having nuclear weapons is the normal condition of the overwhelming countries in the world. I want Scotland to be respected, not feared, as the UK is through the politics of power and domination, hanging on to the vestiges of its imperial past. This is Scotland's one opportunity to gain respect by building an alternative future as a cooperator, as a peacemaker, promoting international law and social justice. All of this new beginning is the one opportunity for Scotland to be a beacon of hope for a world that so desperately needs it. In conflicts all over the world, in Syria, Iraq, Gaza and Israel, Ukraine, Somalia, Afghanistan, Libya, West Pakistan, Sudan, the list goes on and on. This is what is not called isolationism, Alec Rowley and others who are accused of. This is internationalism in action. We must we must officer, please, in conclusion, sorry, just very talk. quickly, I, the respect, I want the respect of living a normal country without weapons of mass destruction. That's what I seek. A yes vote is Scotland's one opportunity to achieve this by putting Scotland's future in Scotland's hands. I now call on Bob Doris up to three minutes, please, and then we move to closing speeches. Uh, President officer, thanks very much for finding time. I know time's been tight in today's debate. I, I get politically active when I was 17 years old because of a, of a UK Tory government that Scotland uh, didn't elect, wasn't accountable to Scotland and didn't represent the values of the people of Scotland. I'm now 41 years old and I see another UK Tory government wreaking havoc in the communities that I, Mr. Doris. that I represent. And that's a fundamental reason why I want a yes vote. I, I got really sick and tired of hearing about the misty-eyed romanticism of the UK that doesn't actually exist in the towns, cities and villages <laughs> right across Scotland. So let me tell you, presiding officer, what exists in the towns, cities and villages across Scotland. Food banks exist in the towns, villages and cities right across Scotland. Driven to food banks, men, women and children because of £6 billion of UK welfare reforms in the last five years. I know individual constituents of mine, female constituents, who are now unemployed because of reforms to the tax credit system. Working poor, now benefit dependent poor. I know individual constituents who are part of the 100,000 individuals, adults and disabilities who have been targeted by the current UK government are quite frankly terrified that the abandonment of DLA to PIP and the rollout of universal credit will leave them much poorer off. I know families whose kids have been pushed into poverty because of UK tax credit reforms for children. So no one in this chamber give me the misty-eyed romanticism of the UK because it didn't exist then and it doesn't exist now and we want a better future for the people of Scotland. In the, in the minute or so that I do have, let me give you some suggestions. So is it about increasing the minimum wage by at least the uh, inflation every year? £600 better off the poorest workers would have been in the last five years had a UK government done that. Yes, it would be abolishing the rollout of PIP, a commitment this Scottish government has given. It would be a root and branch review of benefit sanctions that are targeting the most vulnerable in society. That would happen with a yes vote. It would be uprating the carers' allowance in line with job seekers' allowance so the weakest people in society 
can benefit. Yes, it would be using the tax system to be more fairer, particularly for women, for example, the earnings disregard, which would allow women to earn more money before benefits started to be clawed back. Real equality measures. But do you know something, presiding officer? It kind of doesn't matter whether anyone in this chamber agrees with any of these suggestions that I make. The people of Scotland will decide in the first election after Scotland votes for Scottish independence how we make the society more socially just, how we make this society fairer. But one thing's for sure, that can only happen by bringing democracy back to this country and it can only happen with a yes vote. And we now move to closing speeches and I call on Willie Rennie. Mr Rennie, six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, it's been in stages a half-decent debate, um, perhaps not fitting the, the historical moment yet again that we face in a few weeks' time. Bruce Crawford started off by talking about that he's trying hard to be relentlessly positive in this campaign. He must not have been speaking to Aileen MacLeod, Joan McAlpine, Kenny Gibson, Rob Gibson, Annabel Yoon, or even Bob Doris, who sometimes tries to be positive. You would think from the contributions today that there was nothing good about the United Kingdom. I've already said the UK is not perfect. It's not as imperfect as these people on these benches sometimes want us to believe. We have heard about the creation of the trusted and respected BBC. The National Health Service, with its expanding budget every year since its creation, which has doubled the spending as a share of our national income in the last 50 years and has now been judged the best in the world by the Commonwealth Fund. The welfare state worth billions even though it goes through substantial changes. The defeat of Nazi Germany. The state pension which has grown by £800 since 2010 thanks to the triple lock. The UK is seen also as a force for good around the world. We hold tremendous soft power judged the greatest soft power in the globe by a special magazine that covers global affairs across the world. As a family of nations, we are using that to tackle gender-based violence, to campaign against the death penalty, to fight for religious and sexual freedom, and to champion the law, the rule of law. Together, we have the second large, largest aid budget in the world. For a relatively small country, it's a great achievement. These are things that we can all be proud of and factors that the nationalists omit as they seek to break up the United Kingdom. Of course, uh, yes. Mr. Thompson. I thank the member very much for taking the intervention. I wonder if he's speaking, spoken recently to Alan McRae, the Lib Dem candidate who stood against me in 2011, or Dr. Michael Foxley, the erstwhile leader, Lib Dem leader of Highland Council, who wouldn't classify themselves as nationalists, as Mr. Rennie says, but who have both decided to vote yes. He obviously wasn't in earlier on, but unlike the nationalists, we tolerate difference. We respect people's different views. I think the SNP could learn one or two things from that. Of course, we want to, the United Kingdom to change. I favour home rule in a federal UK. That's the basis of our plan for more powers published by Sir Ming Campbell. People know that there's something missing from this parliament. If we want to do something different, sometimes we can't because we don't have the necessary financial power. So our plan sets out proposals for the Scottish Parliament to raise the majority of the money it spends with the transfer of income tax, inheritance tax, capital gains tax, as well as the proceeds from corporation tax. It means that if we want to cut taxes for those on low and middle incomes, like we've done at Westminster, then that can happen here too. If we want to increase childcare, as these people resisted for so long, as we've made progress on this issue, we can raise the money to pay for it if that is what is required. If we want to do something different for our domestic affairs, Holyrood will have the power to do so. Of course, people need to vote no next month to see the further development upon devolution, which has been widely praised. And if they do vote no, they need to know that more powers will be on the way. But the beauty of these proposals is that we have the broad shoulders, the strength of the United Kingdom behind us to make sure we can continue to make devolution a great success that it has been since its creation.
They have the security of that because Labour and the Conservatives, as well as the Liberal Democrats, have committed absolutely different but substantial change is, def is definitely on the way. I admire the nationalist passion. I do genuinely admire the nationalist passion for their cause for national independence. What I regret is that their passion drives them to rarely question the consequences of their plans. What will be the hit on public spending from the first six years of the policy to cut corporation tax for big business? How will we get the correct balance in our armed forces and where will the security for Scotland come from while we are waiting? How will they tackle the £6 billion black hole as identified by the Institute of Fiscal Studies? How will the £2.5 billion of promises of extra money on welfare come? It's not identified in the white paper. It's not in the white paper. It doesn't count. What services will be cut if the oil revenues are not as wildly optimistic as they claim that they will be? And most fundamental of all, what will the currency be? The Scottish Government reads out a list of options for the currency. Order. One You're in your last 30 seconds. In. One minute they're all ruled in, the next minute they're all ruled out. We need some clarity on this issue. If we do not get clarity, if we do not get clarity on all these fundamentally important questions for the future of our country, because I have the interests of this country as much at heart as the SNP do, but if they are going to have any hope of anywhere near you a respectable result, Rennie. they need to answer these questions so that people have the knowledge, the truth and the facts when they go to vote on the 18th of September. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Gavin Brown. Mr Brown, six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The nationalist case is not just that we would be a successful independent country. The case that this Scottish Government is campaigning on is that we would be a wealthier country than the rest of the UK. That is what they are putting forward to the people of Scotland. They are claiming that we will be £5 billion a year better off. We will be £1,000 per head better off. And as a consequence of that, they are able to put forward the policies that they do. But it is time for a bit of realism from the Scottish Government, because the likelihood from the independent economists and analysts is that we would be financially worse off as an independent Scotland, and we would be poorer than we would be if we were to remain part of the United Kingdom. Analysts will say that we would begin life in 2016-17 in a weaker financial position, and that would become more challenging as time moves on. This is probably why the White Paper only had figures for a single year. <laughs> Presenting officer, if a business goes to a bank wanting to borrow £1,000, they have to show a five-year business plan. But this Scottish Government thinks it's acceptable to put forward one year's figures when they're deciding to separate and break up a 300-year union. The Institute for Fiscal Studies were very clear. They thought the deficit we would, we would face would be 5.2%. The Scottish Government, though, on the other hand, are claiming our deficit would be 2.4%, up to potentially 2.8%. But if the IFS are right, and most economists agree with them, then we would have to have greater austerity in an independent Scotland than we would as part of the United Kingdom, regardless of who was in power at Westminster and regardless of who was in power here. The main conclusion of our analysis, they say, is that a significant further fiscal tightening would be required in Scotland, on top of that already announced by the United Kingdom Government, in order to put Scotland's long-term public finances onto a sustainable footing. Now, the only way the Scottish Government have managed to give the impression that we would be richer is to do two things. The first one is to look back into the past, to try and talk about what would have happened five years ago or ten years ago, instead of talking about what will happen in 2016 were we to be independent. And the second thing that they have done, which is a completely false prospectus, is to assume 
that you could only have a high oil scenario in terms of price and in terms of production. And anyone anywhere knows that is very unlikely to happen year in, year out. Because their financial paper, instead of looking at what they think the finances would be, the starting point was we have to show that we would be better off than the rest of the UK and then put the figures in there to try and prove that that would be the case. The only figures in their financial paper assume what they call scenario four for oil. They discard any other potential scenario for oil. And so, of course, on their paper, they make it look as if we'd be better off and we'd have more money to spend. But that only works if we're pulling in £7 billion in year one, £7.3 billion in year two, and £7 billion in oil revenues after that. Now, that was a question Lewis MacDonald put to the First Minister in his opening remarks. What would the oil revenues, what would the tax revenues be like? The First Minister spent two minutes responding to that question, but not coming anywhere near answering the question on oil revenues. There is nobody out there who agrees with Alex Salmon's figures on oil for revenues going forward. There is not a single person who agrees with Mr Salmon on his future oil revenues. I would, he wouldn't give me a good wave to me. I'll gladly give way to him, presiding officer. Oh. First Minister. Sir Donald Mackay, 25 years advisor to successive Secretary of State for Scotland, agrees with the Scottish Government's oil forecast. Government. Mr Salmon. I, I don't know why they're clapping. It's clear Mr Salmon hasn't even read the three-page letter from Sir Donald Mackay because on his figures, on his central scenario, and Lewis MacDonald knows what I'm going to say, his central scenario, he is almost a billion out from the Scottish Government in year one and almost a billion out from the Scottish Government in year two. So even the person that he quotes in support of him doesn't actually agree with him on the figures of the first year and the second year of so-called independence. So if he's out, suddenly we've got to find an extra billion from somewhere. But what if Sir Ian Wood is actually right and we're £2 billion out for the first five years of separation? Suddenly there's an extra £10 billion to be found. And what about if the other economists are right too? There will be billions to be found. Presiding officer, the independent analysts show that we would be slightly poorer financially were we to separate. And if that is the case, there will not be the money to fund the tax cuts they say they're going to bring in. There will not be the money for the extra pensions, the extra welfare, the childcare, the protection of the NHS, and there certainly will not be money to put aside for an oil fund. Thank you. Mr Brown, thank you. I now call Drew Smith. Mr Smith, eight minutes. Thank you very much, President Officer. This debate has marked the final consideration of this issue by the Scottish Parliament, but it's not... Uh, I or the Deputy First Minister, nor any member who will have the last word on this question. The decision, rightly, is now a matter for the people of Scotland. Self-determination is their right, and they will decide whether Scotland leaves the United Kingdom or whether we continue devolution within the United Kingdom. When we next meet, their answer will be known, and all will be bound by their decision, with a responsibility to make their choice work. On this side, we believe that the Scottish Government has failed to make a compelling case, economic, social or political, for ending our partnership with the people of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Our view is the minority one in this chamber, but I believe it will be the majority wish of Scotland's people. When the old Scots Parliament that the First Minister is fond of referring to decided for union some 300 years ago, ordinary Scots were not asked. The course of history was set by Scottish men untroubled by the people's will. Today, this democratic parliament, a modern institution, created in a spirit of hope and progress, calls for the people to decide their own future. I believe that a no vote will represent a decision to democratically join Britain, to continue devolution and send a message to the rest of the UK that Scots want and choose to work with our closest neighbours and friends for the benefit of all our people. Scotland will never be the same again, whatever the result and Britain will be forever changed too. With Scotland as a committed member of the United Kingdom, we will all be bound to put our political arguments forward in that spirit, and this will be a healthy thing. 
The long campaign already run has re-energised my party and our belief in an idea bigger than independence. The pooling and sharing of resources across the UK, a strong Scottish Parliament backed up by the strength and security of partnership. Social progress and change here in Scotland and across the UK remains an idea and an ideal worthy of the Labour movement. It has been a long campaign. Throughout 300 years of union, there have been voices raised for repeal. All of my life, this question has been the dividing line of Scottish politics. For some on the other side, this has been a motivation which has been a life which has driven lifelong political activism. Over the last seven years, government has, in our view, been on pause. But, but, in, theirs, but in theirs, it has been preparation for the next four weeks and for the day when Scotland will decide its own future. On this side, we can acknowledge the achievement of nationalists in getting to this point, even if they have failed to convince us of their case. President officer, this is a question to which we will all welcome the answer. We are committed to putting this Parliament back to work in the nation's interest, whatever the result. I hope that the debate, that, which will now continue not in the Scottish Parliament, but in the homes, schools and workplaces of Scotland, will be worthy of us all. The Government motion made, by and large, familiar arguments, and we heard them. Independence was, after all, the nationalist answer when the great Labour government of 45 was building our welfare state. It was their answer when the last Labour government created this parliament and embarked upon their quest to tackle child poverty and build a fairer economy. It was their answer when the banks were booming and when the banks went bust. So we've heard little new today. The same arguments, long rehearsed over so many decades, soon to be settled. The questions, too, have been consistent throughout two and a half years of campaigning. How is the enormous risk to our public finances, which ind independent experts have identified, to be managed? How do the admirable ideas about the better society, which we should, should all aspire to, how do they square against corporation tax cuts and the creation of competition on this island, which will surely and inevitably lead to a race to the bottom for Scots and for our neighbours? What are the set-up costs? What will be the, co the, the costs of renegotiated EU membership? How can it be that postal voting will begin in just days and a party which has campaigned for an independent Scottish state for nearly 90 years cannot tell us what is their plan if the currency union which is not in their gift is not agreed? What is the principle for breaking up so many of our institutions to start afresh when there is so little evidence that our hopes and aspirations of what we want from life differ greatly on both sides of the tweet. Is the Englishman and the Scot really so different that no form of government between our nations can be made to work? Do our values against those of the Welsh preclude any adjustment of our partnership such that we can continue to live together under different devolved governments but within one union? Is the desire of those in Belfast for recognition of our national differences really so far removed from the identity of Glaswegians, of Highlanders, of Borderers, of Aberdonians that we cannot possibly share citizenship in a, in a United Kingdom. I acknowledge the right of nationalists to put the case that nationhood must be, must be demonstrated by independence. I even accept that some nationalists will carry on arguing that case even if the nation tells them it does not agree. And I also acknowledge that not all of those arguing for a yes vote are nationalists. I hope that many of them will put the same enthusiasm they have found in this debate back into the mundane old world, a side of constitutional politics. The questions of decent housing, of fair pay, of a chance a, to better our own lives and the lives of those around us. I believe that the positive choice to work together is the best option for Scotland. And the existence and the extension of devolution means that Scotland can have the best of both worlds. I believe that the struggle to make Britain better, better government and better in which to live are a bigger idea than withdrawing into ourselves. In my view, it is the politics of despair to say that the Tories can never be, de never be beat, just as it is conceit to say that the Tories don't and won't exist here. Time is running out in this debate, presiding officer, and in this campaign. For many months, we have heard the Scottish Government make the case for freedom, armed with focus groups and unhearing to those who do not agree with them. The challenge for all of us in the next four weeks is to put the case as well as it deserves to be put, deserving of tomorrow's generation, when today becomes history, so that they can distinguish the honest disagreement that exists amongst us and so understand the decision we are about to take.
So I want to end by just saying this about the National Health Service, which was uh, referred to by Malcolm Chisholm. On this side, we do have a special attachment to the National Health Service. It is Labour's greatest achievement in office, and our biggest task is always to defend it. But the NHS, but the NHS doesn't just belong to the Labour Party, it belongs to the people right across Britain. Devolution allows us to steer our own course, but the ideals of the National Health Service are burned very deeply in our sense of who we are, whether it be administered from Cardiff, from Belfast, from London or from Edinburgh. There are, there are ideals on either side of this debate. And to pretend when all the arguments for independence have fallen away, that it somehow found its cause on the defence of our National Health service is to cheapen the value that is placed on Britain's greatest achievement across the nations of the UK. Indeed, it is to dishonour dishon the genuine and heartfelt arguments that have been made for an independent Scotland by nationalists over many decades. You need to I start hope winding up, Mr. Smith. and believe that Scotland will choose partnership over disunion on 18 September, President Officer, but I hope that it is done on the basis of an honest evaluation of its merits. We covet this prize as much as any on the other side, to return this modern institution of men and women to the work it was created to do, to end the grievance and for a new politics in Scotland finally to flourish. I would urge the Scottish Parliament to support the amendment in the name of Joanne Lamont. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Smith. I now call on Nicola Sturgeon to wind up the debate. Deputy First Minister, 10 minutes. Presiding Officer Ken McIntosh started his speech with a reference to the late Sam Gilbraith, and I want to end today, I'm sure, on behalf of all of us, by paying tribute to uh, Sam Gilbraith. Uh, in the early years of this Parliament, I shadowed Sam Gilbraith in his role as Education Minister. I think it's fair to say I learned a thing or two about the art of politics from him. He would have been on a different side of this debate uh, to me, but had he been here today, he would have injected into it wit, spirit and a good old dose of straight talking and these are characteristics I know we will all uh, miss and our condolences are with his family. Uh, presiding officer, it's a real, a real privilege to make the last speech in the last debate in this parliament before the referendum, before our once in a lifetime opportunity to put the future of our country exactly where the future of our country should be in the hands of the people who live here. Today marks the moment that this debate formally moves out of this chamber to the doorsteps, the streets, the communities, the workplaces of our country. I say formally because in truth that's where the debate has always been. I've been active in politics now for 28 years and as others have said, I have, for all of my life, uh, I have never known a more vibrant, engaged, enthused and informed debate than the one we are having right now. Uh, I have this week alone personally attended public meetings with combined audiences of nearly 3,000 people. People crammed into village halls, church halls, schools halls, people actively imagining what a better Scotland could look like. We should all be proud of that. But more than that, we should all be determined not to let that evaporate. We should be determined to build on that. During her speech, Annabel Goldie was asked what more powers Scotland would get if we voted no. Annabel's answer was that would depend on the party that won the next Westminster election. And there's the nub, Absolutely. presiding officer. If we vote no in four weeks' time, control over our future yeah. passes straight back to the Westminster yeah. establishment. Yeah. Only by voting yes can he keep power here in our own hands. Yes, of course. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary? Secretary. I, I'm sure she did not intend deliberately to misrepresent me. I said that the the solution to this would rest with voters. That's right and proper. Voters will be given proposals and they will decide what they want. It's called democracy. Deputy First Minister. I think Annabel Goldie has, uh, I think, made the point I was trying to make. But anyway, today, presiding officer, I will do what I will do each and every day between now and the 18th of September, and that is make the positive case for Scotland being 
an independent country. I will make some progress and I will take your intervention later. I want Scotland to be independent, not because I think we are better than any other country, but because I know that we are every bit as good. I want us to be independent, not to break the ties of family and friendship that bind the countries of the British Isles, but to ensure that we can play our part in that family of nations on the basis of equality. And I want us to be independent, not just so that we can celebrate what is great about our country, but so that we have the powers in our hands to tackle what needs to be made better about yeah. our country. Ruth Davidson asked us to see what she sees. And you know what? I do see what she sees. I can see and I am as proud as she is of our achievements as a country, many of them shared by our friends across the United Kingdom. But unlike Ruth Davidson, I cannot close my eyes to the 100,000 children being sentenced to a life of poverty by Westminster policies that we cannot stop. I cannot, I cannot close my eyes to the 100,000 disabled people having their support ripped away from them. I won't close my eyes to the obscenity of billions being spent on nuclear weapons while cuts threaten our health service and parents struggle with the cost of childcare. And I will not. I will not close my eyes to the democratic outrage that sees Scotland time and again landed with Tory governments we did not vote for. If we vote no, if we vote no, we continue to be bystanders in these decisions. If we vote yes, we get to come off of the sidelines and be the ones in charge of shaping this country. Canon Kenyon Wright, the architect of devolution, somebody who is voting yes, summed it up this week. Where should the final word over Scotland be, he asked, Westminster or Scotland? To me, the answer can only be Scotland. And I will never understand why good men and women in the Labour Party prefer Tory government at Westminster to Scotland governing ourselves. Yes. Well, I, I thank the Deputy First Minister for giving way. She has less than five minutes to answer the many questions that were posed across the chamber on oil, on currency, on corporation tax, on so many issues. Is she going to even bother to try and answer the questions? I have four, I have four weeks to continue doing what the Yes campaign has been doing, answering questions and campaigning. And as we have done so, support for Yes has risen and it will continue to do so. Signing officer, this has been a heated debate, but one fact that has been established beyond doubt is that we are one of the world's wealthiest countries and I find it sad that politicians on the no side struggle so hard to bring themselves to admit that. I attended a debate last night in Leith, a very good debate of undecided women where Kezia Dugdale and Kat Headley, two rising stars of the Labour Party, put forward the case for no and they did it very well. But during that debate, under scrutiny from the audience, they were forced to admit that this Better Together leaflet that claims Scotland is poorer than Pakistan was, and I quote, probably misleading. Yes, you bet it is misleading. It is outrageous. And if there is any decency on the part of the No campaign, it will be withdrawn. But the reason the No campaign can't admit what the rest of us know is that because once they do, the rest of their case falls apart. Once it is established, that we can be independent, and we can. The question becomes, why shouldn't we be? Why shouldn't we take control of our resources and make our own decisions? Why shouldn't we take the power to protect our National Health Service? And, presiding officer, Westminster cuts do threaten our precious NHS. I know that. The public knows that. Labour in Wales knows that. It is tragic beyond belief that Labour in Scotland has become so assimilated by the Tories in the No campaign that they cannot see the reality that is staring everyone else in the face. Drew Smith said the public own our health service. In England, it is increasingly virgin health care that owns the health service. We need to vote yes to ensure that that never happens to our health service. And as, as with the NHS, as with okay. the NHS, so too with welfare. Joanne Lamont says we need to stay. Order. We need to stay with Westminster to pool resources. That is not the reality 
for hundreds of thousands of people across our country. The reality for them is the pulling away of vital resources. And there was a time when Labour would have stood up for these people, no matter what establishment they had to challenge to do so. Today, Labour stands up for the right of the Tories to do down these people. And that, presiding officer, is a disgrace. Presiding officer, at the heart of the Yes Order. campaign, at the heart of the Yes campaign, is is a pride in our country. Order, but also let us an hear ambition, the Deputy First Minister. An ambition to make our country better. Independence is not a magic wand, but it is a huge opportunity. It means that the decisions about how we use our vast resources as a country, the decisions that shape our country, lie with us. The people who care most about this country, the people who live here. You know, four weeks, four weeks today, I will proudly vote yes. I'll do it not to fulfil a lifetime ambition. That will be an added bonus. I'll vote yes so that I can play my part in building a better country for my niece and nephews and for every other young person in this generation and for generations to come. I'll do it, presiding officer, because I believe no one will ever make a better fist of running this country than the people who live here. I will vote yes above all else because I have confidence in the people of this country. We are a fantastic nation, but we can be so much better. Voting yes gives us the opportunity to ensure that we are. It gives me great privilege to move the motion in the name of the First Minister and ask all of the people of Scotland to vote yes on the 18th of September. That concludes order. Order. That concludes the debate on Scotland's future. The next item of business is consideration of parliamentary bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10853 on approval of an SSI. Moved. Question this motion will be put at decision time to which we now come. <coughs> there are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 10843.1.2 in the name of Ruth Davidson, which seeks to amend Amendment number 10843.1 in the name of Joanne Lamont on Scotland's future be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of vote on amendment number 10843.1.2 in the name of Ruth Davidson is as follows. Yes, 47. No, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10843.1.1 in the name of Willie Rennie, which seeks to amend amendment number 10843.1 in the name of Joanne Lamont on Scotland's future be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 10843.1.1 in the name of Willie Rennie is as follows. Yes, 47. No, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10843.1 in the name of Joanne Lamont, which seeks to amend motion number 10843 in the name of jo Alex Salmond on Scotland's future be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10843.1 in the name of Joanne Lamont is as follows. Yes, 47. No, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10843 in the name of Alex Salmond on Scotland's future be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 10843 in the name of Alex Salmond is as follows. Yes, 61. No, 47. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. <laughs> the next question is that motion number 10853 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. Um, that concludes decision time. Before I close this meeting, can I just say I look forward to us all coming together again on the 23rd of September.